Hello, kitties. It's me, John Kassir, the voice of the Crypt Keeper. <laughs> You're listening to Drop the Mic. <laughs> There are days that define your story beyond your life. Like the day they arrived. Signs of what might be called first contact. The objects measure at least. I'm Colonel GT Webber from the Intelligence. Pack your bags. You're at the top of everyone's list when it comes to translations. Priority one. What do they want? Where are they from? You'll be reporting to me, but you'll be working with him when you're in the show. That's what they call him, the UFO. Who's being carted off in the medevac? Not everyone is wired for what you're about to do. So what do they look like? You'll see soon enough. Every 18 hours, a door opens up. That's where we go in. Welcome back to our humble San Diego podcast. We're your hosts, Wesley and Chris, and together we are Drop the Mic. Here is our final Summer of Sci-Fi show for this year. And the film in question just so happens to be 2016's Arrival. So sit back and suit up for episode 358, Communication is Key. First off, let's get warmed up. How are you, man? Welcome I'm back. I'm good, dude. I'm good. We're doing this again, like, yep. pretty quick, but we're this is our actual scheduled time to do this episode mm-hmm. so we're back on schedule which is good i'm glad that we were able to make it work this weekend very good exciting stuff so it's good to see you Always. so soon yeah yeah it feels like we just did predator yeah <clears throat> all right sir pop culture news anything this week uh, i don't have anything but i also wasn't paying that much attention okay i have a few things we want to hear them. yeah let's go for it course we're heading into uh our spooky season um so i thought it was worth noting that there are rumors circulating of a dr loomis spinoff show where audiences will be taken into the past of the beloved character and his previous cases uh before michael any thoughts on that i know you're not privy to uh prequel stuff not really but it depends on who they get with dr loomis yeah, if they get somebody that's like very captivating, it could be cool. Yeah, know? is it going to be like on Peacock or something? I'm not sure because I know that the the Miramax retained the rights, mm-hmm. so they have the rights. So it must be, I don't know. Because I think because uh, the the David Gordon Green movies were Universal. That's correct. So that's why I wonder if it'd be on Peacock. I'm not sure if they renewed that. Uh, I know A24 was fighting for that, for those rights. That mm. could have been really cool. They were in a bidding war, and then it was like, Miramax is keeping it. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay. <laughs> They've, that's nothing new. Um, but yeah, sometimes things like this can work. Uh, I was a fan of like Bates Motel. Mm-hmm. I thought that was cool, what they did. Um, so it can, it can be fun, if done correctly. Uh, I would like to see something like kind of in the vein of Mindhunter for this, mm. where if they do it where it can stand on its own, then that would be cool. You know, get more people invested. Um, I would like that. Maybe we'll see. We'll see. This is a very there's like a trending thing where I know a twenty four is um they're uh, adapting a Friday the Thirteenth show which is on going to be on Peacock mm-hmm. soon. Whenever that's finished um not sure how that's going to pan out i know friday the 13th have had that franchise has had really bad luck with like a licensing and 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 getting anything off the ground for a while i know there's like some kind of ready revival happening too behind the scenes i don't know who it's going to be mm-hmm. uh i don't know if we've talked about this before but i hear 
uh, Robert England wants Kevin Bacon. To be Freddy? Yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean. That'd be cool if he's willing to sit in the makeup chair. Yeah. It's funny because I don't think that they're like, there's not a super age gap there. So it's kind of like, well, why don't you just do it then, yeah. Robert? <laughs> Maybe he's just tired of being in the makeup chair. He yeah. wants someone else to do it. Yeah. Would you be interested, since we're talking spooky stuff, if they could get Robert to come back, would you be interested in like a legacy sequel with uh, Heather Lane Camp? I would, so long as they don't go like the goofy route, like a lot of those later movies. Mm. ended up doing Mm -hmm. like if they stick with like the you know the the real horror of like the first one Mm -hmm. then or or new nightmare or new nightmare that i would be like super interested in but the rest of them he just turned into like a joke machine yeah yeah well dream warriors is great dream Dream warriors is good yeah but still it's kind of hokey but you're like you love it yeah but yeah i I agree i think that first one where you barely even see him kind of like the jaws effect Fucking great. Yeah. Um, cool. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Oh, thanks. Thanks for sharing that story and asking me my thoughts. Most people don't care what happened. <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on. Are you a fan of Wolf Creek? Have you seen the first one? Is that like that Australian horror movie that was out like 20 years ago? Mm-hmm. That, uh, Tar- that Tarantino was like frothing at the mouth about. Yeah, I think I remember just being very meh on it. I've never watched it since the first time. Okay, but you did see it. I did see it, yeah. So apparently, <laughs> they're bringing this back. Um, I think the guy, like the main guy, and I think he's like one of the one of the guys in Django Unchained. Is John Jarrett? I think so. I think like yeah, after uh after the shootout at Candyland, mm-hmm. and uh, Jamie Foxx is is captured and thrown back in with that group. I think he's one of the guys. Huh, I'll have to go back and see that. I think it's him, like Michael Parks, Tarantino. Oh, he's part of that group. Yeah, he's part of that that gang. Interesting. That guy, John Jarrett, I don't know what he's done beyond this role, but he's really fucking good as this serial killer, mm-hmm. just because he's so snarky and weird and off-putting. Um, if I had to pick something that I loved out of like this franchise, because there's two movies and then two seasons of a show, I thought that the show worked a lot better because you're not confined by time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you're going to give anything a shot out there, anybody listening to this, probably try to um, find those two seasons and check them out because they're really fucking good. Pretty scary stuff. Mm-hmm. But apparently they're reviving this from the new plot. It sounds like kind of the same thing. <laughs> so somebody just really likes John Jarrett being a psychopath. <laughs> And making jokes while murdering people. But yeah, Wolf Creek is coming back soon. For anybody who cares. All right. Uh, A Quiet Place Day One is now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Did you watch that? I haven't, but I've heard great things. I don't think okay. I've heard anything bad about it. Okay. And it has a cat. That's cool. <laughs> cat lovers over here. Yeah. <clears throat> no, that was yesterday. I had my cat dad socks on yesterday. Even though I'm not technically. <laughs> you are. Pretty sure. I mean, my neighbor's cat seems to hang out at my house more so than at my neighbor's house. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you interested in that? Was it you that said you didn't give a shit? Probably. Because I've never seen the second one. Yet? W- really? Yeah. I just kind of didn't care. Like, the first one is good... Except there was like some major plot holes in it that I just was. Are you sure you haven't seen the second one? I, I'm definitely because that's the one with Killian Murphy. Yeah, yeah, haven't seen it. Plus, that came out like when there was still like the weird COVID. That's true. Lockdown where you know theaters were kind of opening, mm-hmm. but like I was like, fuck, it, I'm not going to go to a theater just yet. I think the first movie I even bothered to see was maybe No Time to Die or Dune, like one of those. Where I was like, oh, I'll finally go back. But, you know, believe me, I'm like in the theater with my mask on the entire time. But no, I've never seen the second one. And I kind of was like, I don't know if I care enough to see it. But, you know, if the the new one, if day one is good, 
Maybe I'll check it out. It's got Lupita Nyong'o in it. She rules. And then uh, Chrissy Wake Up, okay, guy <laughs> from, Str- <laughs> from Stranger Things. I forget his name. Forgive me. But I hear he's very good mm-hmm. in the movie. Uh, yeah, check that out for anybody who didn't go see it in the theaters. Speaking of theaters, um, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice comes out next week. Yeah. Are you excited for that? I'm definitely going to watch it. I know I'm not Tim, like frothing at the mouth over it because I'm always like skeptical on Tim Burton. Well, and Tim Burton has not been on his game in years. Little mid. Very much so. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I still have to listen to the Blank Check miniseries and I'm like dreading listening to anything past like probably Sleepy Hollow. I think we do have, we got screener tickets. So I'll tell you how it is. We're going to see it on Tuesday. Let me know. I mean, I heard I just screened at the Venice Film Festival. I heard really good uh, feedback from it on that. I mean, everyone's super excited, super pumped. I love Michael Keaton. So I'm I'm always in. I think that Michael Keaton's performance in the original Beetlejuice is like one of the all-time great comedic performances. Even though he's not in that movie a whole lot. But he is so fucking good uh, when he is on screen in that film. So... I mean, I, I definitely want to see the sequel, mm-hmm. but a little skeptical on the Tim Burton thing and also like being the legacy sequel like so long after the first one. So reading into what people are saying about this, uh, writer was basically saying like we, have, we were waiting to tell this story uh, with like the, the, the perfect like daughter actress mm-hmm. uh, hinting at Jenna Ortega like that they weren't going to do this film until they found that right person. And they're saying that Ortega was that, you know, the perfect fit. Um, so I'm excited to see how that all works out. And I've heard pretty much nothing but good things. That's good. So yeah. Like, um, I mean, I'll definitely uh, be watching it next week. Oh yeah. So yeah, you're, you're going to see it before I do. Let me know how it is. I will. Oh, well. Um, did you try the soda? There's a haunted apple Beetlejuice fan. No, no, but I, I mean, I don't drink soda, but every now and then, I think the last soda I had was the one that you gave me years ago. Uh, the Evil Dead soda. Oh, yeah. And I drank it like while we were doing, yeah. I think, one of our Christmas episodes. Yeah. Uh, so that might be the last time, but I'll take like an apple soda. That sounds good. I'll have to, I have a, uh, I have some cans in my, my office right now. I'll have to give you one. Oh yeah, yeah, try it. for sure. I can't, I, uh, uh, don't come for me if you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all, dude. <laughs> Does it taste like manzanita soul? It tastes, no, I don't know how to explain You just got to experience it. Okay. For if better or for worse. If you're willing to give one up, I'll take one. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> the can's pretty cool think you'll appreciate it um and that if you don't have anything to kind of um add on that's all i had for news this week okay thanks for thanks for having something because i just wasn't paying enough attention but also nothing really stood out to me Mm -hmm. i'm like oh we should definitely talk about this i mean we still got an election upcoming that's talk about that again like make sure that you're registered uh, talk to anyone that you might know who might not be registered. Mm-hmm. I find it hard to believe that anyone would still be on the fence as to, I don't know who I'm going to vote for at this point in time. But if you know any of those people, uh, let them know, like what's at stake. Everything. I, I really do think that Trump's circling the drain though. Every, every story I hear, every, every little bit of news that comes out, it's like, he's definitely, on his way down, but it's up to us to make sure that we flush this fucking turd once and for all. Agreed, man. Agreed. Shouldn't even have to, shouldn't even be a conversation at this point. Shouldn't be. And yeah, I could, it, I mean, don't trust polling because it's only for people that are actually around and bothered to pick up the phone. But still the fact that like the polling shows that it's still very close is ridiculous. (laughs) 
But again, don't believe that. And no matter what the polling says, definitely go out there and vote uh, when the time comes, wherever, wherever state you're in. If you can do it early, do it early. If you can do it by mail, do it by mail. If you can't, you have to actually go day of, then make a plan and get there as early as you can. Be prepared. Do your part. Exactly. So that's my real life news. Weekly recommendations. Weekly Rex. Uh did you watch The Sympathizer? No, but I know about it. It was good. Yeah? It was very good. Yeah. I was I was sitting on it for a few months and was finally got around to watching it. FX? Uh HBO. HBO. Yeah. And it's uh it's very good. It's about like uh if you don't know uh what the plot is, it's about a guy who works for the South Vietnamese police who's actually a spy for the North Vietnamese and even when he gets into the states he's still that double agent and uh, I I I'm going to butcher this name forgive me uh Hua Zandi I think is like the main guy mm-hmm. I that's wrong I really apologize uh he's so fucking good in the show and uh, Downey is in it. He's playing multiple parts, and he's so fucking good in this. And there's even like a scene where like all the parts are like at a table at a restaurant, mm-hmm. so he's like playing off of himself a lot, and it's just really funny. And the show takes a couple of big swings that I don't think really uh, connect every single time. But it was a very, very good uh, show. Very fascinating. I'm excited to read the novel, the Pulitzer Prize reading novel it was based on. Um, but I, I really dug the show, and um, it's got some other great supporting performances. Sandra Oh is very good in it. So I recommend The Sympathizer. It was good. All right. Streaming right now? It, it should be available on Max if it was on HBO. Okay. So check that out. And then uh, I was kind of torn. I usually like to do two. Maybe I'll do three because I watched one and it just like caught the other one the other day just as uh, we were getting ready to do the show. But uh, I just rewatched 10 Cloverfield Lane mm-hmm. uh, last week. Great movie. I hadn't seen it in a few years, but uh, really enjoy it. That's really, it's, it builds up the tension like very well. And that Mary Elizabeth Winstead's great. John Goodman is so good in that movie. And it's just, it's, the Cloverfield movies have always been movies that weren't really like connected to Cloverfield. They mm-hmm. just kind of like, slap that title on them at some point in time to kind of tie it in. But it, like that, that could have easily worked as like a standalone thriller. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, we talked about uh, Trachtenberg on the last episode because of prey. And then I think that was the only other movie he's done was 10 Cloverfield lane. If I'm not mistaken. Directing rise. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So uh, check out 10 Cloverfield Lane if you haven't seen it. I caught it on Showtime. I don't know if it still is. Maybe it's on something else right now. You might be able to find it on Paramount+. Plus. Very good pick. Good pick. Co-written by a director that we're going to be talking about in the mix tonight at some point in time, which I don't remember. Uh, Don't remember him being a co-writer on the film. But that was pretty cool. And the other one... Uh, just because I rewatched it the other day, great Scorsese movie, uh, legacy sequel, the color of money with one of the stars of our film tonight in like a small role. And he's really fucking funny. Mm-hmm. And like the, the cameo basically that he has in the film because he was, he was still like kind of a unknown actor at that point in time. Um, or wasn't as big as he would become in the following years, but color of money. Tom Cruise is great in that movie. Like, I know a lot of people always want to give Cruise shit for always being like Tom Cruise and not, you know, not uh, blending into the role. But uh, I disagree, Uh, especially when he was younger and he played a a lot of different roles. Magnolia. Magnolia. He's great in Magnolia. He's fantastic in Collateral. Born on the 4th of July, I think, is his best work. So, I mean, he used to, he used to do a lot of, uh, dramatic work and I think, uh, he's kind of gotten away from that and has been doing more action stuff. And as much as I love Mission Impossible, don't get me wrong, 
I would still love to see him go back to, you know, doing doing like a Scorsese movie or, you know, doing a, a Francis Ford Coppola movie or something like that. Michael Mann even, like hook up with Michael Mann again. But I, I was re well, I was rewatching The Color of Money the other day uh, when I got home and it's it's a lot of fun and Cruz is great. And um um Mary Elizabeth Mather Antonio is fantastic as his girlfriend in it. She's got a lot of great dialogue. Paul Newman, fantastic. And it's got a great soundtrack, as any Scorsese movie does. Where did you watch this at? Where is it streaming? It was probably on Showtime or HBO or something. It was like I just flipped on the TV uh, when I got home. So probably either Max or Paramount would be my guess if it was one of those one of those two channels. So in your off time, when you turn on the TV, you don't do you just go to the, straight to those movie channels to see what's going? Usually, on? sometimes I'll put the news on, especially now as we're in the election season, we're gearing up. Like I'll put the news on. To see, you know, what what's going on, what bullshit did Trump pull today, something like that. But, you know, after a while, it's like, you know, you're hearing the same shit over and over again. So I'll put on the movie, or especially if I'm in the, the kitchen, either preparing a meal or doing some baking or something. Uh, a lot of times I'll turn something on just to have in the background. And if it's like a great movie, you know, I'll leave it on. And the color money popped up whenever I was flipping through those channels. I was like, oh shit, like I haven't seen the color money in a few years. I'm like, let me leave it on. I didn't have it on for, I don't know, 90 minutes or so. I caught it like maybe 20 minutes into the film. Okay. So I just put it on, left it on. Yeah. Yeah. I do the same thing. I, that's why I was curious. Yeah. Yeah. So those are my wrecks. I don't usually like giving a whole lot, but because I was planning on wrecking 10 Cloverfield Lane and then. When I came across the color money, I was like, oh, you know, more people should watch this movie if they haven't seen it because it's great. It's one of those like Scorsese movies is like from the eighties that kind of gets lost in the shuffle mm -hmm. because it's between like some of the really big movies that he was doing. And, uh, he was just kind of, dare I say, like a director for hire for, you know, a decade or so while he was trying to, to, uh, get some other stuff going and he made great movies. In that decade, like everything he's made in the, and everything he made in the eighties was great, whether it was a hit or not. I know the color of money was a hit, but you know, my love for the king of comedy, of course. And, uh, I believe I have recommended after hours before, which is another fantastic film. I think that last temptation of Christ is a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So check out his eighties work. If you're unfamiliar with it. Hopefully they're not. I hope not. All those movies are great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do you got? <clears throat> oh, we're obviously talking about uh, Denny Villeneuve tonight. So I wanted to um, just wreck both enemy and prisoners. Um, I know last, uh, our last episode, the predator episode, you said like that Villeneuve is a great sci-fi director but also his non science fiction work is also fucking incredible. Oh yeah. It, it's incredible. I mean, uh, we're definitely getting into a little bit more tonight, but it's, I think it's, it's pretty great that he has this, this great work, especially the, the movie that he does before this one, mm -hmm. which is really good. Mm -hmm. And then like he does arrival and it's kind of like, he's done nothing but, sci-fi sense not that that's a bad thing because all those movies are great and i know it's just a few movies but they're but they're big and then you probably took them a few years to to take care of but i, I just think that he's a great filmmaker and he's kind of become like one of the the newer filmmakers that i've been following and really have enjoyed all of his films yeah yeah very um how do you say diverse mm -hmm. Or he has the ability to, but Enemy, Gyllenhaal, I think that's Neon, right? I don't remember. Maybe. It's not, it's not A24, it's not like Focus. It's a very like, like, uh, small company. Yeah. But great movie. Um. Very moody. I, I believe that was done before 
prisoners. Mm -hmm. It was just it was because it was a smaller film and a smaller production. It didn't come out until after Prisoners because of the Joe and Hall connection. But Which, I believe that the enemy was shot first. I think that was a good uh, m marketing play, right? Probably, yeah. To to get everybody on that Jill and Hall train, but uh, yeah, Enemy's great. It's very obscure and weird, like a doppelganger story. Uh, he's very good at doing uh, like a mood, like setting the mood, mm -hmm. atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, all day. You can make a movie about nothing, and you're into it because he just has this amazing way of building tension and making you just care mm -hmm. somehow. But yeah, enemy is great. If you haven't seen it, a lot of people I don't think know about it. So check yeah, that out. When we, when we had it at the theater, it wasn't even on digital. Like we screened it on like a, a Blu-ray. I have a funny story. We've maybe talked about this before, but I wanted to go see it when, uh, I think it was still Pacific was down there, right? Or Re Reading? It was Reading, and you, you saw it at the gas lamp, right? Yes. It was Reading by that time, yeah. Reading, Reading. All right, so nobody wanted to go with me, so I just said, fuck it, I'm going to go down by myself, because I don't want to miss this. And the goddamn sinking was wrong. Oh, shit. Yeah. And then I went and I complained. I was like, it was like me and one other guy who was like, not, he was watching. But he wasn't mad. Mm -hmm. Like, it was like, well, are you really watching? Like, what's going on here? Is it glitch in the Matrix? But I <laughs> went and complained. And I remember the lady, I can't remember. She was like a, just an attendant or something. But she was like, oh, yeah, we'll fix it for you, whatever. Never and fixed it. Never fixed it. And I'm assuming it was just the disc was fucked up or something. Maybe, yeah. There's no way to fix that. Yeah, but, but I don't. I don't remember showing that on digital. I I believe that was Blu-ray because it was just that small of a of a movie. So, long story short, is I got frustrated <laughs> because it was like so distracting that I just fell asleep. Oh no! So, so where did you see it since then? Um, when it came out at home, and it was it was. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. I still have, I have that Blu-ray right now. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody, I feel like nobody has that physical. I, I don't. <laughs> I have all of his other movies, just not that one. <laughs> and then, you know, jumping onto the Prisoners bandwagon, what a movie, man. Yeah. I remember going to see that. I was super hyped for it um, beforehand, and you you know, you got... Hugh Jackman, Jake Gyllenhaal, in a very, like, weird role. And he fucking murders it. Yeah. I remember asking you, because I hadn't, I didn't see it for, for many years. I didn't see it when it was out. Mm -hmm. Somehow missed it uh, at that time. But I remember asking you, like, what was the deal? Because he had, like, the like the tattoo on his hand. He also had, like, kind of a... like a, Like a tick. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember asking you, like, what, what was his deal? And uh, you're just like, oh, yeah, man, it's just like kind of like his thing. Yeah, it just seemed like he was like a more of a, how do you say, like, subculturist that just happened to be a detective. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what the vibe he was giving off. Like, mm, just strange mm -hmm. guy. But he's so fun to watch in that movie because he, he's like he, he, unpredictable, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you got Jackman, powerhouse performance. Yeah, Terrence Howard, Viola Davis, uh, Maria Bello, right, is is Jackman's wife. Mm -hmm. um, Melissa Leo, mm -hmm. Paul Dano, Paul Dano, so fucking good. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of good talent in that film. Probably Villeneuve's best, like non sci fi stuff, in my opinion. Maybe his best work. Probably a lot of people will fight me on that because he's done some. Hugely epic stuff. I mean, I'll fight you. We're talking about this movie tonight for a reason. <laughs> but, uh... I have a mad love for Prisoners, man. Just because it's, it, it, it's like... Kind of feels like he's channeling Fincher. Mm -hmm. But just is killing it. You know? And then we'll get into later on... But he kind of channels somebody else with a rival. Mm -hmm. In a very, like... Just murdering, you know, that style, in my opinion. 
But yeah, we'll talk about more, more about that later. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> Prisoners is very good. I, I've every movie that he's made since Prisoners, because that was kind of his American debut. Mm-hmm. And I know I said Enemy was shot first, and it takes place in Canada, so that may have been a Canadian one. But obviously, it came out after Prisoners, and you know, this was it was marketed as like you know from the director to Prisoners and everything. But everything he's made since Prisoners, I've been a huge, huge fan of. Yeah. Just like, uh, hasn't been made a bad movie at all. You can, right. you can talk shit about maybe box office draw, but as far as pure, like, movie magic, the guy's got it. Yeah. I, I mean, he, he came on the scene a decade ago, you know, to at least most American audiences. And, uh, He's always been like one, of, since then, he's been one of those directors where I'm like, oh, dude, I'm super excited to see what he's got going on next. Now, I'm not going to wreck this, because I didn't really enjoy it the way that I was hoping that, like, my mind would be shifted. Mm-hmm. But a few a couple days ago, I went to Hazard Center. Uh, That's a theater I haven't been to in years. Yeah, to, uh, pretty much to hate watch The New Crow. Oh. <laughs> I got a funny story for you. <laughs> so, yeah. My girlfriend and I, we went to watch The New Crow. Uh, I like that theater. They have great prices. Um, food is good. Uh, but the fucking house that they put us in was, I shit you not, felt like it was 50 degrees. Oh, really? The entire... And I'm, I don't mind AC. I love it. But it was like, when I have to t- take my jacket off to give to my girlfriend because she's freezing and we can bar- almost see our breath. <laughs> and there's nobody else in the goddamn room. Uh, yeah, it was kind of like a little torturous. Yeah. Did you, you should have said something. Say, hey, can you cut the AC in this theater, dude? It's like fucking the Arctic in here. I was just too lazy. I don't want to miss the bullshit that was on screen, apparently. <laughs> so you said you hate watch them. I'm assuming that you did not enjoy it. No, 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 no. Um, uh, it has a few things that are okay, but overall, like I feel like they really went with a. They kind of lean more into the supernatural mm-hmm. of that story, right? The first one, of course, he's being resurrected from the dead stuff so it's there but it's kind of more glossed over and they just kind of jump over that right but um this one is like like the villain has powers and they're doing it feels more bold i guess Mm -hmm. but it still falls flat like i feel like bill skarsgård i was kind of on the fence when they announced him it was first it was jason momoa i don't know if that would have worked either because he's not a strong actor no um, Yo, Momo, you killed it, bro. <laughs> but Skarsgård just feels like he was, to me, felt like he was sleepwalking in this. Mm-hmm. Like, it didn't seem like he was trying, or his just character was wrote like kind of dumb. Mm-hmm. Um, wasn't that a movie that had been made or was in production? For a long time. Like, mm-hmm. I know that they've been trying to, like, remake the movie for years. But, I mean, like, this specific version of it with Skarsgård mm-hmm. and with, was it Rupert Sanders? Mm-hmm. Director? Mm-hmm. Wasn't this something that had been shot a long time ago? I've been they, hearing about it for what feels like five, four or five years. So, like, it probably had mad issues. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, they didn't know how to market it or it was getting like really bad like test audiences or something. Because mm-hmm. to me, it it feels like this has been something that's been the movie for years and it's like coming out. I mean, they dumped it at the end of August, so they didn't have high expectations for it. Um, But I'm willing to bet that it had a, a ton of trouble behind the scenes. I, uh... I kind of dug like the inner, like they do this thing where he's in the in between worlds, mm-hmm. and that's really cool. So there's a couple like of of fun things that uh that bring something new to the story, uh, and the ending. I loved the ending. I thought it was cool, and 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 uh, 
I, I had did a write up a couple days ago and I said like if this film has any heart at all it's a, within those few like last frames mm-hmm. and if you ever get to see it on you know streaming or wherever then you'll know what I'm talking about like when it comes there like on HBO or something I'll probably give it a little bit of my time at least yeah but yeah when you asked me was that last week if I was, had any plans to go see it I was like yeah none at all I just wanted to see if people were like bullshitting the how bad it was mm-hmm. you know um but i kind of lost hope when <laughs> that first trailer hit and it was like they gave you everything mm-hmm. the whole fucking you know the whole movie is essentially in that encapsulated in there fka twigs i thought she was good um is it the first time she's been in front of the camera uh no I mean, she, like she, an acting job i mean she's in um um that shia labeouf film uh honey boy Oh, okay. I haven't I haven't seen Honey Boy, but okay. Yeah. So she has a you know Okay. It's been around for a little bit. Um yeah, she's good. But like yeah, Skarsgard, I don't know if it was just like he was lost with the material, but it seemed like he was sleepwalking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um but anyway, yeah. Let us know what you thought about the crow if you, <laughs> if you watched it. Because no one else watched it because it fucking bombed. Well, well yeah. Like I said, they dump it at the end of August, so like it's. I think Deadpool and Wolverine ended up being the number one movie this this last weekend. Also, it might still be this weekend too, and Labor Day weekend. So Romulus got booted. I think so. I don't think it's top anymore. I think Deadpool and Wolverine ended up coming back. Interesting. Um, I know did, Romulus made two hundred eighty million. That's exciting. I mean, hey, good for that. That's a movie that I was just okay on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, it had some really good stuff in it, but also had some stuff where I was like, this is dumb. But you have to, we have to agree that for a sci-fi film to be getting that kind of traction, that's a win. Yeah. Because we're going to get more stuff like that. Or, or, you know, studios will be less hesitant to pull the trigger, especially with a, it had like a kind of modest budget for what it was, Mm -hmm. you know, so it was successful. I know we're getting the Alien TV show, FX TV show. I think. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about that because I like Noah Hawley's work because mm-hmm. I've been a, I'm a big fan of Fargo and his work on Legion was very good too. I'm confused because now this is like, from what I read, it's supposed to be a prequel too. That's yeah. going, but like even farther back. But it's just like, yeah, what kind of budget are you going to need to for Earth to look like how it did? You know. <laughs> It's like, would you really want to shoot yourself in the foot like that? But okay, whatever. I'm excited still. I'm I'm super excited for the TV show. Can't wait. Can't wait to check it out. Uh, going back to the crow though. Excuse oh yeah, me. your story. Uh, actually, a little bit, two little stories, and then we can uh, jump in. Um, I was talking with a friend of mine the other day, and she was like, you know, I haven't been to the theater, and she doesn't go to the movies all that often. She's not like a big movie uh, person. But I was talking with her and she's like, yeah, like I have to go back to the theater because I want to see the crow. And I was like, you better go like tomorrow because it'll be gone because it's bombing. She's like, yeah, I know. She's like, I like Bill Skarsgård. I don't know what to say. I like FK, FK twigs. I don't know what to say. She's like, and I like the original crow. She's like, I just like morbid curiosity. Like want to check it out. I'm like, okay, well, do it soon. So she, you don't know if she's seen it yet? I highly doubt she's going she's gonna to make it. But even, even uh, I was talking to my buddy Jorge, because he's a big movie mo- movie goer, and he was saying, yeah, I don't know if I want to go check out The Crow. Like He's like, everyone is fucking dumping on it and everything. I was like, I don't know why they were so hell-bent on remaking that movie for so many years. Like, the first one isn't high art, but it's still like very good. It's got the vibe. It's got the look. It like it's got like that cult appeal, and I think a big part of that is the Brandon Lee uh, thing. But also like it's like of a time and a place, and it had that like crazy, um, like rock, like goth industrial soundtrack mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that like made it like part of pop culture. You know, along with like the the unfortunate death of Brandon Lee on on set and everything, so it's like I think that's the movie is more of a cult film 
than an actual like this is a fantastic movie. I'm not saying I I dislike it or anything, so don't don't uh twist my words there, but I think that it, it's got all these other things going for it that made it work. And it's kind of like that's it was kind of like the perfect uh magic. Did you sit that in was there? Did you do the episode with us? No. On a crow? No. I could have sworn what, was, you did. No. Uh, was that a Ryan episode or was James still? It was James. It was James. Yeah. No. Uh, Proyas, the director, uh, has been dumping on this reboot. <laughs> he, I think he tweeted out within the last, what was it? It opened last weekend. Yeah. It was like, Oh, I always thought that this, like them rebooting this movie was a, like, a cynical cash grab but it seems like there's no cash to be grabbed or <laughs> some shit like that <laughs> and it's just been slam after slam <laughs> with this oh hey i mean Proyas had two good movies in him he did uh dark city right? yeah yeah which we covered on this which we some... covered on this show for summer, sci-fi. summer sci-fi last year right no it was our first summer sci-fi so two years ago now two years ago yeah holy shit man I'm, yeah i'm old <laughs> Time flies real <laughs> fucking fast, dude. Oh, man. Um, But yeah, like, I think that what makes the first one so good and so appealing is a lot of the different factors that it had going for it. And I've, that was kind of just like, you had, you had kind of like this perfect magic go on. And every time they talked about rebooting it with, you know, this actor that I know Bradley Cooper at one point in time was rumored to be the guy like they didn't learn from those shitty sequels no like you guys tried this and it was obviously didn't you know it just got worse and worse it, it seemed like although shout out to mark de costcos who was the guy on the tv show oh yeah 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 because mark de costcos is awesome but yeah like he I, just talking with Jorge, I was like, I think, you know, it had, the original had a lot of different things working for it that made it good and has made it part of uh, like a, a, a pop culture uh, milestone. But I don't know why you would ever try to remake it. How was the soundtrack? I mean, that was always like a big thing with the original was that incredible soundtrack. The uh, the new soundtrack is not. It's not bad. It's good. It's got some good music. But when I, mean, I saw Gary Newman was in it, I love me some Gary Newman. It's not bad, but it's. I don't know. It's just it felt like two different movies because they kind of dive more into the romance, right? Mm-hmm. And it's that's okay. Um, the action is good, but it's like it doesn't feel like a cohesive piece to me. Like it feels like the tones were off, mm-hmm. and that's what I had a, issues with. It was like it was stumbling in the dialogue, and then the action was very like taking cues from trying to be like John Wick esque, mm-hmm. and it just wasn't working. It wasn't working for me. I don't know if I just being biased and I already wanted to hate it or not, but it was just like whatever. I mean, who's the villain? Uh, the fucking guy, what's his name? Not on the level of Michael Wincott, right? It's the fucking guy from 28 Days... No, not 28 Days... Uh, 30 Days of Night. The Is that Danny Houston? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And he's good. But he's also not in it that much. Yeah. He's good. Right? But I was just like, I don't know, man. There's just something so disjointed about what they were trying to do. I was like, man. <laughs> I mean, hey, dude, you hate watched it. You still contributed to the box office. Yeah, got to have some popcorn. It's okay. <laughs> Freeze my ass off. Freeze. <laughs> <laughs> All right, main focus. Talking about Arrival, it's PG-13. It's from 2016. It's a sci-fi thriller. It runs at one hour and 56 minutes, and it's got a well-deserved 94 on Rotten. Written by Eric Heiserer, directed by Denny Villeneuve, starring Amy Adams, Forrest Whitaker, and Jeremy Renner. What is that? What, what did? What? How does that Jeremy Renner song go? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Oh god, they used to they used to play that clip on uh like the Deezus and Marrow show all the time. Are they still on? No. What uh happened? what happened? I think they just kind of wanted to do their own thing and they split. Um cuz I I never listened to the podcast but Showtime would always air like their their talk show mm-hmm. and I would always watch it for the the 3 4 years or so that it was on. It was really fun. I really liked them. They were funny as hell. I was all hell. I think the Renner song was like Something like Papa Do I gotta tell you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they would just like play that clip and just like trash it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! All right, the film tells the story of a, um, of Louise Banks, who is tasked with translating an undiscovered language as Earth is suddenly visited by extraterrestrial beings. The film's plot was taken from a 1998 novella entitled Story of Your Life by author Ted Ching. Um, Around just 50 pages long, the novella is packed with ideas of predestination and theoretical physics. The film screenwriter, Eric Heiser, eventually found the source material and worked on a spec script, which would be passed, passed on for some time until finally gaining some interest from 21 Laps Entertainment, who would pitch the script to filmmaker Villeneuve. Uh, Teaming up with Heiserer and bringing a final draft together. Uh, The production took place in early June of 2015, lasting just 56 days, with most of the shoot taking place in different parts of Canada. Released in the U.S. on November 11, 2016, the film grossed $203 million overall on a budget of just $47 million, <clears throat> making its mark on many best-of lists for 2016. Arrival would also go on to be nominated for eight Academy Awards. Overall, Arrival is an incredible slow burn sci-fi film that showcases so much talent it's almost unbelievable. A perfect cast, the cinematography, the score, everything here is clearly firing on all cylinders and I can say without a doubt, Chris Nolan must have been sweating after walking out of this film because in my humble opinion, Arrival has helped cement Denis Villeneuve as one of the greatest filmmakers of our time. Thank you. Five out of five, Abbott and Costellas. <laughs> I was wondering what your rating system was going to be. <laughs> I mean, hey, uh, we're talking about it for Summer of Sci-Fi. Uh, it's obviously a big, big movie for me. I have said before, I'll say it again, I think it's probably the best sci-fi movie of maybe the last decade, maybe the last two decades. Better than Interstellar? Better than Interstellar, for sure. Okay. Yeah, for right. sure. For sure. I think the only other sci-fi movies, and again, this we'll get into this in like 30 seconds here, that might uh, fight it fight it out for that is either Ex Machina or Annihilation. Mm. Uh, I think those first two Garland movies are fantastic. And there was a period of like four years where my favorite film of the year was a sci-fi film. Go figure. Mm-hmm. And it was either a Garland movie or a Villeneuve movie. You know, because there was there was Ex Machina and then there was Arrival and then there was Blade Runner 2049 and then there was Annihilation. And then, you know, the couple of years in between the COVID year, especially, but then like Doom was my favorite film of 2021. Part two might be my favorite film of this year. We'll see. But um I think that Arrival has been the best. And if not, it's definitely like top two or three in the last decade. If someone else wants to throw out like what could be another great sci-fi movie in that time, by all means, this is my opinion. But it it's one of my favorite, definitely my favorite film of 2016. And uh, we can get into that uh, a little bit later, especially the major snub at the Oscars for this film. Um. Yeah, I'm super excited to talk about it. I love this movie so much. And it's just, I think what what makes it really good is it's as much of a drama as it is a sci-fi film. The sci-fi is great, but it's not like way overblown. It's kind of like, like what makes Ex Machina very good is it's more of like a personal like story than 
uh, you know, some big bombastic sci-fi movie. Yeah, they're playing with humanity. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I like Interstellar, don't get me wrong, but it's low on the list of Nolan films for me. Lower on the list of Nolan films for me because there's some stuff in it that's great, and then there's some stuff where I'm just like, uh, it's a little weak in some spots. Plus, the thing that really bugged me about Interstellar was there wasn't as much space stuff as there should have been. Mm-hmm. They were on that fucking ice planet for a long time. You talked about Villeneuve being, you know, one of the great directors of this time. We talked about it kind of in the opening or in the in the Rex, but the run that he's been on since, like, working in the states. I mean, he's from Canada, so it's not like he was coming from overseas or anything. But Prisoners, Enemy, Sicario, which I would probably put up as the one that might be his best non-sci-fi. Okay. All right. But I think that a lot of what makes Sicario great, not only is the direction, but I think that's a very strong script, but also the three performances in that movie are amazing. Um, Plus, the Johan Johansson score for that movie is really fucking good. It's really menacing. Uh, and then after Arrival, I mean, I, I told you, he, he does these these other movies. One kind of a... Um, prisoners, would you say, is like, it's kind of a drama, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I mean, kind of an intense... But I wouldn't go so far as, like, maybe say... I wouldn't really call it a thriller. It's like... Per se. True crime drama? Yeah. Maybe? Or- yeah. Enemy... That's like a weird, it's kind of like a weird, you, like you said, it's like a doppelganger, kind of like a horror, maybe horror light, like an A24 horror, even though it's not A24. Uh, that's a very like moody film. He does Sicario, which is a crime, a crime flick. But then after that, like his next four movies are all sci-fi. I mean, he's fantastic in it, but he does Arrival. He follows that up with Blade Runner 2049 and then the, the two parts of Dune. I know he's hoping to make a third part, but I think he's going to squeeze something in between uh, the second one, which was out this year, and whatever the the third one ends up getting made. So I'm very excited to see what it is he's going to do. But he's like, he's made exclusively like sci fi movies for the last eight years or so now. You talked about the short story it was based on, I just read it a couple days ago to do prep for the show because, like you said, it's only about 50 pages. So I jumped right into that. Um, and it's very good and has some of the, like the basic groundwork for this story, but the, the movie kind of takes it and, uh, you know, levels up, uh, the movie or the, the book or the short story is, is very kind of like personal. Uh, it's not as, not quite as big of, of a scale as, as the film presents. And there are some differences, um, but a lot of the the bones are there, especially like some of the lines that are said are are there. So it's it's very impressive that you know you take a, a short story like that and you make it into this this fantastic film that's like very emotional. I got like very emotional in a few scenes mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just because like it just like hits you like really hard. Some of the emotion is there in the in the story, but not nearly as as uh, big as it is in the film, or as uh, uh, powerful, I would say, as it is in the film. Now, you say Christopher Nolan was the the director. I have a at least two other directors that I think were major influences on this film. Uh, I mean, we can't you can't ignore the obvious like Stanley Kubrick mm-hmm. like references. Um, but also like Terrence Malick, I would say, especially like the way that the opening montage is shot, mm-hmm. you know, even like the end kind of has some of those, those scenes where it's a lot of, um, of just like scenery with like some voiceover over it, especially like the, the opening of the film. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say are definitely like Terrence Malick. I mean, even like the beautiful shots of like when they first come into the valley and you see like the, the fog, like rolling off of the hills. Into the Valley. Gorgeous. I know that was shot in Canada. It's supposed to be Montana. Um, but just amazing scenery in the film. 
And it's something that Terrence Malick has always been very good at, at least in you know some of his earlier works. So I think that I think that there's a, a big debt to to his work as well. Yeah, I can't argue with you there. Did you see like Heiser's list of of credits before this? Mm-mm. Not great. <laughs> it's kind of funny when someone that doesn't have like really great credits all of a sudden comes like out of nowhere with some masterpiece. And then, like, doesn't really do much of it else. Because uh, his credits were the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, which everyone seems to universally hate. Uh, Final Destination 5. So he did Nightmare? The, That's according to the, the IMDb when I looked them up, yes. The Jackie Earl Haley? Mm-hmm. <laughs> did you ever see that? I think I did at one point in time. That's the Rooney Mara one. Yep. So I definitely have seen at least parts of it. Speaking of Strange Show, is Kyle Gallner in that movie? He in is, the remake? But he looks like a baby, but yes, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's very young. I mean, even that was, what, 15 years ago now when mm-hmm. that movie came out? Um, Yeah, according to the IMDb, that was one of his earlier credits. So he does the, the Thing prequel. You don't like that? I thought it was okay. It's okay, but obviously I love the thing. And what I love, uh, a big part of why I love it is everything is practical. And when they went like CGI for a lot of that stuff, it's just, it's dumb. Yeah, they really should have bit the bullet and did and and committed fully. I think uh, it would have, it would have aged more gracefully. Yeah. I mean, Scott Mary Elizabeth Winstead. She's great. Joel Edgerton. Joel Edgerton. But, oh, like, overall, very weak film. Hours? Have you seen Hours? With, I think, Paul Walker? Yes. He did, he wrote and directed that. That's his only directing credit. Uh, I've never seen it, so that's that's why I ask. I don't remember. I think that's a, I want to say a smaller film, Mm -hmm. right? Was that more like right before his death? Yeah, I think so. I think that came out like right around the time. I don't know if that was shot like years before and then just finally had come out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I think it's like around that same time. Uh, Lights Out and then Bird Box were the other ones that he had done. So, mm. Oh, he did Lights Out. Yeah. That uh, was Blumhouse? think so like sandberg like david sandberg that's a pretty li- solid little thriller i thought that was like based on like a short that sandberg had done it is so did he not adapt his own work for that's, a feature that's weird hmm. but yeah that that movie's good it's fun i don't know if i've seen that i feel like you'd you'd probably you'd have i remember the short because I, I watched a short over at your place years ago yeah, the short's pretty scary. But I don't know if I've seen the, the, the film. If I did, it was years ago then. Interesting credits. Yeah. Like, again, not a whole lot of great ones in there, but then I think this is a masterpiece. So it's just kind of amazing. I mean, we talk about, uh, um, what's his name? Craig Mazin, who had, who had done, uh, you know, like a scary movie. Not scary movie. Yeah. Scary movie. Like three or four? Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, like, he he writes the, the fucking Chernobyl miniseries, which I, I I think is fantastic. And universally beloved. So it's just, it's kind of funny how that happens. So anyways, he, he adapts that. Um, like you said, he, he kind of wrote it on spec, so it was being shopped around. And then when he takes it to... Uh, 21 Laps with the Sean Levy's uh, production company. Uh, They got it. uh, They're looking um, to get a director for it, and they bring it to Villeneuve, who I think this is about the time that, like, Prisoners, he was in work on Prisoners. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, So they bring it to him. He'd been wanting to make a sci-fi film and just kind of hadn't found the right material. And they bring this to him, and, you know, he immediately connects with it. Uh, 
and eventually uh, hooks up with Heiser and is able to uh, work on the script with them. And uh, they they get it going finally. I don't know. He must have been committed to Sicario, uh, because obviously he does that one first. Mm-hmm. But uh, because he follows up Sicario with with Arrival. So what I was looking through was uh, just to kind of see like you know the the endings, how similar they are. The ending to the the story is very similar to the way that the the film ends. The original ending of the script I read uh, said that the the heptapods gifted the humans with blueprints for an interstellar ship to um, help them in like three thousand to help years. them in the three thousand year timeline that they have. But I guess because it was so close to the release of Interstellar, they they decided to to back off of that. And um, you think that's that was a good choice, right? To to switch to do the ending that they went with instead of that. Oh yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. I think the I think the ending uh, packs more of a punch in the film than it does in the original. Uh, the original ending for the the script with them giving them the the blueprints to make a build a ship to come and help them. I mean, they, it's, it's very much implied in the film that the, you know, the 12 ships that land and the information that they give them, like Renner says is like one of 12, you know, so everyone has a piece of the information. So they may end up getting the means to, uh, to make a ship to come and help them in, in the, the three millennium that's supposed to pass. But, it, the film never says what was actually, you know, part of, you know, this one of 12 thing that everyone was given. Was it blueprints? Was it some other means? Every government or entity dealing with wherever the ships land, they're given a, a bit of information. So everyone, everyone, all the countries that are, that are dealing with the ships, they're all given a piece of information. A, you know, twelve. There, there are twelve parts to this information. Each one is given a piece, and that's what uh, you know. Louise Amy Adams' character says at the end, like you know, to force us to work together for a change instead of you know everyone being isolated. It forces us to work together, and I think that's what the the heptapods are after. Is if these if humanity works together, then they can work together for the greater good. And they can come and help the heptapods in 3,000 years when whatever happens that they need the help from humanity. So, was that blueprints for the ship? Because they never really discuss it. They never tell you exactly what the information pertains to. And again, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with the ambiguity mm-hmm. of, of you know, what, was that, what actually was given. Again, this isn't like a, a big... Like bombastic sci-fi, sprawling sci-fi. It's more insular, and it's really about her journey and what is given to her—the gift of knowing the future, basically. The gift of she learns their language, but their language isn't linear. Mm-hmm. It has you know no beginning or no end, and that's portrayed in you know their writing, which is circular. And what she is given is the site to where like time for her isn't linear or at least she, she doesn't perceive time when you're when she learns their language. And that's why, you know, you get the flashes of the daughter and uh, all that, which you see at the beginning and you're assuming that that was a daughter that she had that passed away before the start of our story. But as you go through the film, and she still has these these visions and these flashbacks, which you think are flashbacks, turns out to be her visions of the future that has yet to happen. Because as she slowly learns their language, uh, she starts thinking like them, and because they do not perceive time linearly, linearly, I hope I'm saying that right nor does she at the end. And, again, this film is a lot more personal than it is, you know, the big the big story in the film. And I think that's, that's why 
they chose to to do that was it it makes it a uh, a more grounded more personal story yeah and people you're not you're not taking off the focus yeah from her story yeah i hope i explained that well enough i think that so it wasn't like super rambling no i think you got it but that was I I think that yes, they are probably given the the blueprints in that one of twelve, but the movie doesn't I specifically lay that out and stays more with Louise's uh story arc and her experience in the film. So I mean we just kind of spoiled what the what the main crux of this movie turns out to be. Mm-hmm. I don't care. I mean, if you're listening to this, I'm hoping that you've seen the movie. Twenty sixteen. Twenty sixteen. You've had eight years to do it. Someone I have been trying to convince for years to watch it still hasn't seen it. But yeah, that's that's the whole thing. You're you're seeing these these memories that she has, you know, throughout the film, and uh, as you get into the climax and into the third act, when she realizes what's happening, you realize that she has no idea what she's actually seeing. She's as confused as us. Not not that we're super confused, but she's confused by this. And then it's, no, like, because you learn their language, because of the circular nature of it, it's nonlinear. Now you perceive time. And then the, hepto- the heptopods even tell her when she has, like, the face-to-face with them. The, this gift, this weapon, opens time. Because she asks, you know, how they could know the future if they need their, if they need humanity's help in 3,000 years. And it's the weapon, the gift that we were giving you opens time so that now you perceive time uh, in this way. And it's the realization that this girl that you see, you're, you're seeing your future. You're seeing your future daughter. So, okay. Does that make sense? It does. I'm it not does. like asking if you, if it makes sense like to you, because I know that you get it, but I'm hoping I explained that well enough for the listeners. I didn't like ramble and get stuck in the weeds. You're good. Okay. You're good. Also, I want to say <clears throat> that I, I want to say, so I saw this when it came out in the theater and maybe once at home a couple years ago. Uh, so this might be either my second or third watch for the show. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed it. Um, this last time around, like I really, I understood, I was like, I understand why he picked this. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was just cause I was like locked in, but I feel like I enjoyed it even more than like the first time, maybe just because I knew. I was more familiar with it. You know how you can kind of unpack things more, but I, I dig it like structurally it's not doing a whole lot. It's very dialogue driven, Mm -hmm. but also very beautiful to look at. But there's like this ambiance to it. That's very impressive where they're not trying to impress you with special effects or anything. Like it's more, like you said, grounded and, and, um, Kind of like how that could, and like if that scenario were to happen, how it could play out, potentially. I know we're jumping ahead here, but one of the reviews kind of, kind of calls it out, and I'm looking for it really quick. Uh, Time Magazine said it was a sophisticated grown-up sci-fi, a movie about aliens for people who don't like movies about aliens, because it's not really the point of the film. Even even the effects are very minimal. Like I would say, like the biggest effect in the film is just the heptopods themselves, which are not even you're not even seeing the full heptopod for the whole. Pretty yeah, much, you the don't whole movie. you don't see it until the the very end when she has you know I said face to face earlier, but she's face to face with them the entire time. But like when she's actually brought into like their area of with, that spaceship without a a. a f- what do you want to call it? Like a guard or... Yeah, because it's basically like a big window mm-hmm. that they're communicating through. In the book, it's like kind of like a mirror. Because uh, uh, in the in the book, the, the ships aren't on Earth. They're in orbit. But they send down like these, like basically two-way 
mirrors that act as like a two-way radio that they can communicate uh with them but in the in the ship in the film there's basically like a big room and it, it almost looks like a like a conference room or almost like an interrogation room you know you're looking through the window at what's going on in the room but you're not you're separated by a barrier a barrier mm-hmm. of some sort so yeah she sees them and even even then when you know you see the when you see the aliens they're cloaked in like clouds for a lot of it you see you see them but they're really cloaked behind the clouds and even when she is actually in their part of the ship they're still a little bit obscured by the uh by the clouds that's what i i think i really dug this like this envisionment of aliens because of course none of us really know what they look like given that they even exist um so it's always fun to go into different projects and see what they're going to, you know, what that, how do you say, version is going to look like. And this one is like really out of the box. Mm-hmm. Like nothing we've ever seen in film, right? And then there's a, uh, this is kind of off topic, but I dig, there's like this really split second, like couple seconds of frame where Amy Adams is sitting in a room and then all of a sudden like, either Abbott or Costello is like in the room with her and then it cuts. And that's like a call back to enemy. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking when, when I rewatched spider, it the other right? Yeah. It was like the end of enemy with the spider in the room. And it's, I, I know it's like two different uh, cinematographers between enemy and, and this one, but I was like, Oh, it's almost like the same lighting. Yeah. In the room too. Yeah. That kind of like dimmer, like kind of yellowish tint. Uh, in the room but yeah that's i agree and i I agree with you on the look of the aliens too it's kind of cool to you know see something that looks different than what you would normally see i mean everyone always assumes like alien life would you know be like some version of us where you know there's arms and legs and everything but maybe there's not you know we look like how we look like because we evolved on this planet at this place in time Something else elsewhere in the universe could evolve much differently. Could look like anything. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. And for the record, I do believe that there is life out there. It's just the numbers game. The universe is too fucking large for this to be the only fucking place that has any sort of life. And you say, well, how come we haven't heard from the aliens? The universe is large. It takes millions and millions of years for anything to travel. Say what you will about me, but yes, I do believe that there's life out there because it's just a numbers game. I mean, of course, you're a big X-Files fan. (laughs) Things are making sense, you know? There are trillions of galaxies in the universe that we know of. And each galaxy has billions and billions of stars. And each star has at least a planet, if not many planets, uh, surrounding it. So just, I mean, do the math. That's what I believe. That's my thought. Do I think they all look like little green men with laser guns? No. Like I said, life could have evolved much differently because it's in a very specific place and environment and time. What do you want to say? This is Amy Adams is fantastic in the film. When we get to the end and we talk about the Academy Award nominations, this was the big snub that the movie got, was that she was not uh, nominated for this movie. I think it's one of her best performances in the film. And uh, it's worth noting that I think her filmography is pretty solid. Pretty solid to a point, and then kind of like after this, there's like a significant drop off for a number of years. Mm-hmm. I think she's coming back. She's got a big movie that's supposed to come out this year, mm-hmm. so hopefully she gets it back. But uh, her pre-arrival filmography, yes, I would agree, is very fucking good. Comes in here every night, gives me shitty tips. <laughs> <laughs> Cheap fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Another movie which she's very fucking good in. She's in it. Apparently, this was Villeneuve's first choice for the role. 
Amy Adams. And she read the script and immediately accepted it. So that's good. Again, I think this is one of her best films, if not the best. Yeah, when you're watching this, I can't imagine anyone else in the role. Like, she just is that character, yeah. you know? Yeah, and she she brings the, the like, quiet parts and she brings like the like the she's very good playing the mom role in those in those uh flashbacks yeah. flash forwards mm-hmm. whatever you want to call you, them yeah the vulnerability is very believable yeah but right. she's also got some bite to her when she you know when they're discussing you know the the plan for how to talk to the heptapods and everything and she tells uh Forrest Whitaker great actor great movie shout them, like shout them out in in this film um there's really only, I would say, like four, four or five leads. Mm-hmm. There are four or five actors, like really, in the movie. Everyone else is just kind of like background. Um, Michael Stuhlbarg being one of the others. Uh, we'll talk about his filmography in in a few. But you know, when she has to tell Whitaker about, he's asking, you know, what's, why do we have to do it this way? And she has to explain, you know, we have to make sure that they understand what a question is to begin with. Then do they understand like what the intent behind the question is? She's like, we have to go through all these steps. That's how you start communication. Uh, She tells him the story about the kangaroo, which I read is actually a myth. Didn't actually happen or happened, but uh, well, let me, let me get into it. She tells him the story that when captain cook, ran the grounds uh, near Australia, they went in and they were, met the Aboriginal people and they were asking like, you know, what's the animal that hops around, you know, with the baby in the pouch? And they said kangaroo. And that's how it, it got its name apparently. And then she says, you know, that's not like kangaroo meant in their language, in the Aboriginal language. I don't know. I, don't know. I read that that's a myth. And... The the name kangaroo was actually like they under they kind of understood the question and kangaroo was like that specific type of kangaroo was what they had what they called it. Uh, that's what I had read in my research that the story she tells about the kangaroo is kind of a myth because they understood the question and the answer that they gave was like specific to that type of of kangaroo. But it's worth noting that in this in the arrival story, yeah. she does acknowledge that the story isn't true. Yeah, she does. She does acknowledge that the story isn't true and says, but it proves her point mm-hmm. that you know we have to like really break down the communication with them in order to start actually communicating. So that way they don't build this like false rapport and like there's miscommunications mm-hmm. happening, right? Because uh, Forrest Whitaker's character is like, yo, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you kind of like baby talking them? Let's speed it up, the, speed up the process. And yeah. that's their way of, she's kind of grounds him and like, look, I know what I'm doing. We need to build, you know, this relationship from the ground up. I mean, they came to her. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the other way around or she wasn't like saying, oh, hey, like you need to hire me. They came to her and it's kind of like, you came to me for a reason. You need to let me do what I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's that great part in the beginning, like when he first meets her, like in the office Mm -hmm. and he says, oh yeah, you know, we met whatever you, you made a quick work of that Farsi that you translated for us. And she immediately hits him back with, well, you made quick work of those insurgents, but they're coming to her because they have kind of an established relationship with her. She has top secret clearance Mm -hmm. from the previous job that she had done for them. So, uh, you know, they're, they're looking for her and her expertise. And when she says that she needs to meet them face to face or, you know, have direct contact with them. She can't just listen to something on a tape and then translate it when it's not even words. It's not even like a a language spoken, obviously, because it's an alien language. You know, uh, she says that she needs to, you know, meet with them in order to start uh, talking and start learning. She needs to be there. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. they say, you know, nope. And she says, they say they're going to go, like, you know, look for someone else. And she asks, well, if you're going to go, like, find this person, you need to ask them, you know, about this. And then, you know, whatever his answer is. And then the next night or two nights later, whatever it is, they show up on her doorstep. With a helicopter. Yeah. (laughs) Knowing that she's the right person for the job. 
and they're gonna have to you know capitulate to to her uh not necessarily demands but what she needs and what she has to do another great part where i think she's like super fierce and like really funny is like a quick little throwaway thing and i wish i could remember the line that stuhlbarg has he's these he's a cia agent and obviously like everyone is viewing these aliens as a threat and how can they harm us how can everything that we that we do in there be used to against us and they're talking and at one point in time like like the Chinese uh, delegation isn't uh, really having a great rapport with, not rapport, but things aren't working out the way the Chinese want it to work out with the aliens. So they're going to go dark. They're not going to share any of their information with the group, with this larger group of, uh, you know, the 12 countries or 12 locations where these ships landed. And like then the Russians are going to follow suit and everything. And there's that discussion. And st- I forget what Stuhlbarg says. Amy Adams says something, we need to do this. And Stuhlbarg, like, immediately, like, rebuffs her. And she goes, do I have to, like, do I have to talk to him? And it's just, it's like a funny, just a little quick, like, you can see her, her uh, annoyance at him. Trying to do his job, but in doing his job, impeding hers. So I think, I think she brings that vulnerability. I think she brings that uh that sadness, but she also brings, you know, the the real sharp wit and sells that she knows exactly what she's doing. She's the smartest person in the room. So I'm glad that I'm glad that she's in this movie. I'm glad she took it. But speaking of, I think she's fantastic in the uh the Russell movies. All uh She's great in both The Fighter and American Hustle. What else? Vice. She's really fucking good in Vice. What's the What's the one um, that you didn't care for? With uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson. Oh, Nocturnal Animals. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. I'm not big on that movie. Um, nor is it, I wrote down some Amy Adams movies so I could refer to it because I knew I would forget. Oh, uh. Julie and Julia, she's really good in that movie. And uh, The Master. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, like, she's fantastic in those movies. No, I didn't care for Nocturnal Animals. And uh, the big one that I always say I don't really care for were Sharp Objects. She's good. I just don't care for that as a whole. I thought a lot of that shit was really drawn out, where it didn't need to be as many episodes as it was. Have that... uh soundtrack on vinyl yeah it was like a record store day press is it like a found soundtrack or was there like an original score to it no like the existing stuff yeah because you know how she's like playing Mm -hmm. records and Mm -hmm. everything constantly yeah it's cool um also want to shout out in the movie which i think is a secret masterpiece uh that we've talked about before a few times is catch me if you can one of her first films she actually plays like a fairly large role in the latter half of that movie. And apparently that was a movie that should have got her more recognition and kind of didn't for a few years. And then she did this little movie called uh, June Bug mm-hmm. that she got recognized for. And I think she got, an, it's in my notes somewhere, I believe she got an Academy Award nomination for it. Yes. And that kind of put her, put her on the map with uh, some bigger movies. Did she do Leap Year too? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which was it? Richard Roper said, "Like the only thing that stops that movie from being a complete dumpster fire is her." Because <laughs> apparently that wasn't. The, I remember that movie kind of coming out and bombing and being like pretty badly reviewed. It, it got dumped in January, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, if uh, if I remember the Richard Roper review of it, it was kind of like she's the only good thing in this movie. <laughs> um. Also Enchanted, uh, which I've never seen, but apparently she's she's very good in that, kind of playing like this plucky uh, princess type. What well, um, what are your thoughts on her? As isn't she Lois Lane in the? Uh... She's completely fucking wasted in those movies. She, she doesn't get to do anything interesting. I mean, maybe she got like a big payday out of it. Good for her. Even in Man of Steel, yeah, not 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 much to do. No. 
No, they didn't need that to be Amy Adams. I mean, there's a lot of things that are wrong with those movies, but it's kind of like I feel the same way about Lawrence Fishburne in them too. It's kind of like he didn't really give him anything to do. He just hired like a big name, mm-hmm. and you know you're you're spending a lot of money to get this this person, and you're not really doing anything with them. Nothing worthwhile of their talent. I want to shout her out in another movie, but I think it might be a summer of sci-fi movie for next year. Okay. So we'll talk off the air. And if anyone's paying attention, they'll probably figure it out. But, but I mean, she, after, after Arrival, I think the only movie that she does, I mean, obviously Sharp Objects gets her, uh, uh, I think some awards recognition, like Emmy Award recognition, maybe Golden Globes as well. I think the only thing that she does that's kind of worthwhile after this is Vice. And then she has like some shitty movies. I think she does an Enchanted sequel, but then I heard that, that was just kind of like there was really no reason to do that. But she does have a couple of decent movies upcoming, one of which is this year. Something called Night Bitch. Where apparently she's a werewolf or will turn into a werewolf. Really? That's what I read. It's kind of like a wild premise. <laughs> from It's from uh, Marielle Heller, who... Shout out to great movies that she did. I know she did a, a third, and I can't remember. It's got Kristen Wiig in it. Um, I want to say it's like Diary of a Teenage Girl, but I'm not 100% on that title. Um, but Marielle Heller did uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me, which is a movie I really enjoy mm-hmm. with uh, uh, Melissa McCarthy. And the Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood movie. The... the um, Mr. Rogers movie with Tom Hanks. So she's the director of Night Bitch. So I'm kind of excited to see that. I believe that comes out this fall. What a title. Yeah. <laughs> and then she's on deck to do a Taika Waititi movie, which I believe will come out next year. Okay. So uh, hopefully she gets it back. Uh, she was in that Hillbilly Elegy movie, which everyone fucking trashed and. Now that guy's running for fucking vice president, which you, is insane. You blew my mind. I had no idea that that was based on his life. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the movie called Woman in the Window, which I never saw, which I remember seeing trailers for, and then like the pandemic happened. I think it just got dumped on Netflix, but I heard it was garbage. Yeah, I tried to watch it, and it was like non-sent. What do you, how do you say that? Nonsensical? Mm Mm-hmm. Like, incoherent, borderline incoherent. I had to shut it off. I just couldn't get into it. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Maybe i give it another shot. But yeah, that first time, because I was excited about it. I thought, it's Amy Adams. This is going to be solid. And, you know, you get to watch it on for free. Uh, But then it was just like, not what I thought it was going to be at all. (laughs) Yeah, it was weird. I think I might have that book. Maybe I should read that book and see see what they saw in it to make it a movie. Back to your thing on Nocturnal Animals, which is the same year as this. It comes out like like a couple of weeks after this, if I'm not mistaken. I will die on the hill of, I think Nocturnal Animals is, yeah, it's dark, pretty grim, but it's pretty okay. I wasn't into it. Michael Shannon's good. I just like, I uh, wasn't into that movie. At all. I mean, it's got Joan Hall. I don't know. Maybe I should give it another shot, but I'm just... It's Tom was, Ford, right? Yeah. I yeah. was just, like, so fucking disappointed with it. I'm like, you know what? I don't really want to watch it again. I think I watched it again to see if I could see what you what you saw or, like, what you told me about it. And I was all, no, I still like this. I mm-hmm. think it's good. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm sick in the head or something. <laughs> Maybe I should give it another shot. Um... But yeah, I just, I wasn't into that movie. But I, I, I'm dead serious. This comes out like a week or two after Arrival. Of course, riding the high of Arrival. Probably. It's like, <laughs> that's, that's some big <laughs> shoes to fill. They're probably like, oh, this movie's getting like a lot of big traction. Like, let's throw this one out at the same time. Exactly what they did. The same thing, the like enemy. Yeah. Right. Nocturnal Animals is not a feel good movie whatsoever. <laughs> no. <laughs> it is it is pretty dark and it's got like a pretty downer ending. Um but yeah, I'm I'm stoked on her in this movie. I think this is one of her one of her best. I just read you a list of everything else that she's fantastic in. Did I mention the Muppets? You did the not. The Muppets is such a good movie. With uh Jason Siegel? Yeah. 
It's so fun. And I was always like a big Muppet fan. I used to watch a Muppet show all the time. And that one's good. I don't like the the other one. Came out like right after it. Muppets Most Wanted. <laughs> I'm kind of meh on that one, but I really I really like the Jason Siegel one and uh with Amy Adams. So I told you I would shout out Stuhlbarg and Whitaker. Uh I mean Jeremy Renner. We talked about Jeremy Renner. Like he he's in uh, American Hustle with her like just before this, a couple of years before this. Both of which, like both of whom I think are fantastic in that movie. But I'm also someone that really loves that movie, and I know that a lot of people don't. American Hustle? Yeah. Yeah, it's good. American Hustle's it's good as hell. And it's it's it does that almost like Coen Brothers thing where some of it is so fucking funny because they're just, they're just like some of the some of the shit that goes on in that movie uh is very comical. And then there's some like more serious stuff in it. But I think that entire that entire cast, I think that movie is really good. Yeah, I remember I've seen it a few times, and every time I'm 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 into it. I think it's it's very entertaining. Yeah, big swings as far as performances too. I beyond Three Kings, which which I absolutely love. I think that might be the best Russell movie. Renner, very great in the town. Town, great movie. Hurt Locker. Great movie. Uh, I mean, at the time he does this, he's obviously in the the Marvel movies. I think I think this movie, Civil War, Civil War, yeah, that he was shooting Civil War, and they they had to not delay the start, but they had to wait to start photography on this until he was done with uh, shooting Civil War. Props to him for being hungry to you know to do other different stuff because he could probably just ride that wave of. It, I mean, it's kind of like what Downey did for those, what, 10, 12 years where he mainly just did the Marvel stuff and like didn't do anything else. That's why it was so it was so exciting and fun for me to see him like an Oppenheimer. And now he just got paid like nine hundred million dollars to come back to as come back. Dr. Doom. Let's give a shout out to Stuhlbarg, who plays CIA agent Halpern. Uh Love him in Boardwalk Empire. That's kind of where I first noticed him because he played Arnold Rothstein mm-hmm. in Boardwalk Empire. Mm-hmm. He's great. I, I didn't know because I didn't see the movie when it came out. I saw it a few years later. It was that he did the Coen Brothers movie, A Serious Man, before Boardwalk Empire. So I Boardwalk Empire, because I had seen that first, was my first exposure to him. But then I went back and watched A Serious Man. I was like, oh, this was like the year before that. Which is great in... Uh, He's great in the small part in Hugo, which is a movie that everyone listening should know that I love wholeheartedly. Um, and he's fantastic in his his role in that film. The Guadagnino movies, um, Bones, and, Bones and All, which we talked about a couple of years ago, which is a favorite movie of yours and mine uh, from that year especially. But uh, he's he's really fucking chilling in that one scene, mm-hmm. and he's got a bigger part in uh, "Call Me by Your Name." But I think that he's the best part of that movie, especially his monologue to his son to Chalamet at the end of that film. Um, but he's he's a, he's an actor that I'm always like super excited to see, and of course, like you got Forrest Whitaker, who's always awesome, who was in you know The Color of Money. He's in Platoon, like that same year of the, as The Color of Money. Um, fast Times. Fast Times. God, he's so good in Fast Times. <laughs> um, uh, have you ever seen The Crying Game? Yeah. Good movie. And he's, he's really good in that. Um, obviously, The Last King of Scotland. Ghost Dog, dude. Dude, so I was going to tell you this. Have you ever watched like the Criterion, like the, the closet picks? Where people are in like oh yeah yeah um who I want to say it was Gershon and maybe it was maybe it was someone else they were in the closet and like there's because Ghost Dog is on Criterion mm-hmm. which you have right I have because I, I have it too so that's cool um someone like almost picked it and then they put it back 
right? Or they're just like, oh yeah, like yeah, like Force Whitaker, like Ghost Dog. This is a good movie. I don't know if it was Gina Gershon or not. It might it might not have been. It might have been someone else. But then when Nona Ryder did it, and she was picking her movies, and I think it was her last one where she just kind of like at random picked one, and she picked like Ghost Dog. <laughs> And she's like, oh, I love this movie because Jim Jarmusch, she had worked with Jim Jarmusch before. Um, so she was wrecking like a lot of like Jarmusch movies. She was wearing like a Down by Law shirt. <laughs> oh, shit. And then, uh, you know, when she picked like Ghost Dog, she was like, oh, like that's so crazy, you know, because I love this movie and I love Forrest Whitaker and Jim Jarmusch. And she's, you know, like, you know, showing her shirt and everything, like the Down by Law shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember like reading some of the comments like, She's the coolest person on earth because she picked Ghost Dog. <laughs> like that's like a super underrated movie. <laughs> yes. So love him in Ghost Dog, and I'm a big fan of Panic Room. I think he's so good in Panic Room. I was just gonna uh, give a shout out to Panic Room. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you're gonna bring it up or not, but yes. No, it's he. He's. So fucking good. He's so good in that movie. It's kind of like he's the criminal, but he's also like the like the voice of reason. Yeah, he has the most empathy out of yeah. all the guys. All the other guys are fucking scumbags. Yeah, like they're all, they're psychos, and he's the one that's just kind of like doing it because it's a job. He has no intentions of hurting anyone. Shout out to Jared Leto with the corn roll. <laughs> Who gets Jared like half Leto. of his fucking face burned off. That's a good movie. Go watch Panic Room. <laughs> Anyways, I just wanted to shout out those guys and uh, shout out some of their their really awesome performances in some movies that might not get as much love. Or TV shows that might not get as much love, too. Go watch Boardwalk Empire. And after, like, the third season, stop watching it. Ditch it. (laughs) We said before that, you know, the shot in in Canada. Uh, And, again, like, they wanted they wanted like a good place to shoot where you could get like a sense of scale, but that you know there weren't mountains that would dwarf the the uh the spacecraft and uh they didn't want like just completely flat land where you can't really tell like the size so they that's that's where they shot it and again like the scenery is beautiful, especially that uh shot of them when they're coming in for the first time and you can see like the like the clouds and the fog like rolling off of the hills into the valley Mm -hmm. amazing uh you wanted to shout out the cinematography in the film done by bradford young uh who had shot uh ain't them body saints good david lowry movie um selma which i think was like a year or two before Oh, uh, A Most Violent Year. That was the other one, that another big one that he did, which is a very fucking good movie that I think is like really underrated. I have that one. That's yeah. a good movie. Oscar Isaac and Jessica Chastain are awesome in that movie. A24. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Chris Abbott mm-hmm. is very good in it. That guy's always good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just rewatched um, um, It Comes at Night. Oh, yeah. Yeah, me too. Solid stuff. Yeah. Watch Possessor, man. I will. I still. I still have to watch. God Possessor. damn! I watch. Still haven't seen yeah, it. yeah. Watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I watched Infinity Pool, but I just never got around to watching Possessor. I will. I promise. I've been wanting to do like a David Cronenberg like rewatch, and I know that's not David. I know it's his son, but maybe when I do the Cron- the David Cronenberg like rewatch, I'll throw Possessor in- into the mix. Yes. So, uh. Um, Villeneuve's always had like very good uh, cinematography in his films. I mean, he's had three. He did three successful uh, collaborations with Roger Deakins. He did Prisoners. He did Sicario, and then he had I believe he won the Oscar for his uh, cinematography in Blade Runner. But he wanted he wanted to he sought out Bradford Young, or he wanted a DP that he said was going to be at E shooting in natural light. I don't know if there was a reason why he didn't go with Deacons for that. I don't know if Deacons was tied up on something else at the time. I tried to look to see if he might have been, but nothing really lined up in that time frame. What about that? What, 1917? That was that was years later, but yeah, he shot that because he, he's been shooting a lot of Mendes, uh, Sam Mendes' pictures. 
I think he shot everything from Jarhead on because Conrad Hall, who shot the first two Mendez pictures, uh, passed away. So then I think Deacons has shot all the other Mendez pictures. Um, so he wanted someone that would be at ease shooting in natural light. And again, watching the movie, I was like, oh yeah, there's most of the cinematography is done in, you know, natural light. There's not a whole lot of, uh, setup. And he said he, he wanted, he wanted to be like a dirty sci-fi film and wanted it to look more realistic, slightly boring. He said he wanted, he wanted it to make, make you feel like this was happening on like a Tuesday morning, like on a rainy day. And uh, that's why he was looking for, for this. And then he, he said this. He said, I wanted a movie to have strong roots and realism. I wanted a cinematographer who would not be afraid to deal with instant intimacy. It's a very specific sensibility that I felt in Bradford's previous work. The color timing was also a big part of the look of this film, as Young and Villeneuve wanted to use it as a means of matching Louise's state of mind. And Bradford Young said, I went for cooler colors when I wanted Amy to feel worn down. And we tried to pull back on that a little bit. And then Denny stopped me and told me not to be so concerned about skin tone and let her be pasty. Let her exist in the melancholy space. Let us feel that visually. And, you know, I agree with you. Like, the cinematography in the movie is very fucking good. It's like score. Like, done by Johan Johansson, who had collaborated with him on uh, Prisoners. Yeah, and and Sicario, like I said, I shouted at the Sicario score earlier because it's like super menacing. R.I.P. Yeah, who passes away? Twenty eighteen. Yeah, it's right after I think he finishes the man. He did scored Mandy. Yeah, I was trying to look up to see what other scores outside of Villeneuve he had done, but the only two I saw were Mandy and The Theory of Everything. Like, the only two, like, what I would consider more mainstream or, you know, well-known movies. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, famously, I guess, was supposed to work with Villeneuve on Blade Runner. And for whatever reason, that didn't work out. I don't know if that was a studio thing. I don't know if Villeneuve and him weren't seeing eye-to-eye on the music. But he gets let go off of Blade Runner, and then, you know, Hans Zimmer uh, takes over that. I'd be kind of curious to see, hear what that Johan Johansson score for Blade Runner would have been, though. One of my favorite parts of of this movie of Arrival is uh, music. Musically, is the book ending of the film with the "On the Nature of Daylight" piece of the score uh, from Max Richter, which apparently is the reason why Johansson didn't get uh, an Academy Award nomination. Is because they thought, well, he used this piece at the beginning and the end of the movie, so it's not like a totally original score. But like other movies have done that, where they have an original score and then have you know an existing piece of music at some point in the movie. They're going to say, oh, apparently their thing was people will get confused and think that that was part of his score, and it's not. It's going to like muddy the waters. But it's like that's dumb. Sounds like you just didn't want to give him an award. <laughs> They have weird fucking rules sometimes, but the fact that, you know, he used an existing piece of music to bookend the movie, so what? It works. It, it's incredible. It's beautiful. And I even wrote about it after I saw the movie that, like, I, this piece of music is so good, like, very melancholy, and but it bookends, you know, this this beautiful, beautiful film. And it's just, like, even just hearing the music stirs up the emotions in me. Not to mention, you know, what you see in the opening montage and, you know, what you what you see at the end in the ending montage, you know, the the future and her getting together with with Ian and uh, accepting the journey, even though she knows where it's going to lead eventually. But still, you know, wanting to do this and just knowing that she's accepting it and this is what's going to happen. So it's it's like a very sad piece of music. But I think it works like super well. And it's kind of a shame that they didn't award uh, Johansson because that, that score is very good. Yeah. It's not like all over the place in the movie. But when it does pop up, it creates that uh uh that vibe. But it's it's really cool how she's trying to figure stuff out and then at some point she'll have like kind of a flash of the future and it'll help her figure out something here. Like the whole zero sum game where she's talking about that, where, you know, we need to, you know, we need to share. 
and um she has the 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 memory quote unquote of her daughter asking her you know what this term is and there's there's as the movie goes along there's certain pieces i don't mean to get off of the topic i'm trying to go to right now but there's certain pieces where as i was watching the movie the first time i kept wondering like wait we're like her and ren are married at some point in time because she's talking about oh like if you want science like talk to your father because he he mentions in the the helicopter ride in the beginning like you know what she wrote in the preface to the book about language is the cornerstone of civilization it's the first tool like or the first weapon drawn in war and he was like no it's science he was like yeah it's science and then when there's the thing with like the whole science you know ask your father if he wants science i was like wait like were they married but they don't they don't know each other at least they don't act like they know each other like what's going on so i started to kind of question what's happening here uh so like when you know that point comes with the zero sum game thing when she gets into that and then um uh, you start wondering like oh like who is the father of this of this kid and then when you realize that oh she's seeing the future it's kind of like i think it might be renner but because she because she is learning the language there's the great point after she after she has like the meeting with the aliens, like the actual in person meeting with the aliens, where she knows what she has to do because China is threatened by the aliens all of a sudden, and they say, you know, if they don't leave, like we're going to terminate them, which is they don't know what's going to happen. That's why they're trying to evacuate everyone because if if one country attacks the aliens, would they retaliate? You know, we don't know. So we're going to try to uh, evacuate. But she she has the thing. She knows. She says, you know, I know what we have to do. She has to get in contact with China to dissuade them from taking this path. They need to actually work together. And she needs to figure out some way in order to convince them to do that. And then after she gets out of the alien ship, um, there's that there's a great little moment where you know i was always thinking like is renner like what what is his relationship to her but when she gets out of the ship and he goes to comfort her she was like i know now like why my husband left me and he's like oh you were married because it's she knows i mean she it might she might not know that it's renner at that point in time in, in her journey but she knows why her husband left her you know, which is going to happen in her future now. Mm -hmm. And Renner's kind of like caught off guard. Like, oh, like, wait, you were married? No, she's, she wasn't. She will be eventually in the future. But I like, I really enjoy the sequence where she steals the satellite phone and she's going to call General Shang in, uh, in China and persuade him not to go through with the plan that he's going through. And there's that great, uh flash forward of her meeting him at the at the party the reception that you know we all work together whatever that uh party is where you know he says oh i i confess like i came here to meet you and she's like oh yeah why and he's like you know you did something you know was 18 months ago i believe is the timeline mm -hmm. that not even my wife was able to do and she's like what is that and he's like you were able to get me to change my mind and she's like wait what because she's not getting it because at that point in time she's perceiving this before it's actually happened mm -hmm. but then she's like oh i called you and he's like yes you did you called me on my private number and she's like i don't have your private number and he takes out his phone and he shows it to her whatever the number is and says now you know so that when she has the satellite phone, she knows what number to dial now. And then he says, you know, I'll never forget what you told me. And she's like, what did I tell you? And he says, my wife's dying words. And she has no idea, like, what are you talking about? And then he whispers in her ear, like, what the dying words are. So that when she calls him in the present, she knows what to tell him in order to say, hey, like, I know... I know something that you don't, you need to listen to me. 
And by this time, you've got securities like hot on her trail. Yeah. The, the, the great reaction from Stuhlbarg when they're like, someone's dialing a sat phone. He's like, who's? And they're like, it's yours. And he's like, what? And he's like, kind of like looking for it and doesn't find it. And he's like, oh, you know, keep, you know, keep that, uh, Coordinate those coordinates. It. Yeah. You know, let me know. And then they, you know, they chase her and she, she runs and hides and, you know, Renner comes in and she says, you know, buy me, you know, 20 seconds so I can get this. They're ready to shoot her. And Stuhlbarg says, you know, you're committing an act of treason, but whatever it is that she tells General Chang, General Shang, excuse me, he changes his mind, does not, you know, choose to attack the aliens, chooses to work together as a whole. And there's that, just that whole sequence where she's trying to get on the phone and she has the meeting with Shang in the future is a great bit of editing. It's like one of my favorite parts of the movie because it's just, it's so cool how she's getting the information in the future that she's going to end up using in the present to to speak with him and you know, to convince him not to go through with whatever he has planned. And I know that he whispers it, or at least you can hear her telling him in in Mandarin, I think, is what she's speaking. Uh, but they don't subtitle it. They don't talk about whatever it is that he said, which I really like the ambiguity of it. Apparently, uh, Heiser was like, oh, no, I had scripted that line, and Villeneuve just left it out of the film. But I like that you don't really know what is said. Because it's like, do you really need to know? It's not important to the story. Whatever it is that she said to him convinced him to change his mind, and it was what his wife's dying words were. But I do have what those dying words were, (laughs) because it was scripted. And uh, uh, according to... Um, Heisserer at the Fantastic Fest premiere in September of 2016. Uh, the last words were, in war, there are no winners, only widows. That's what, that's what his wife told him as she was dying, and that's what uh, Louise tells Shang when she gets him on the phone. But, again, do you really need to know? I guess if you speak that language, you know. Yeah, you might, you might be able to pick up on it, but <clears throat> I don't need to know because I don't think it's important to the story. I don't think it's important to where we're going. Just like the blueprints aren't necessarily important. No, not at all. Not at all because it's not about you getting every, all the information. It's just about you being on this journey. Exactly. So that's, that's one of my favorite. I mean, as much as I love the movie as a whole, like that's one of my favorite sequences in the film is her figuring out like how to get this information in the future that's going to help her in the present to get everyone to work together. And then you start seeing after this point in time, you know, the the TV news reports are all saying, you know, like this country worked together, you know, they're, everyone is, is back online. Everyone is doing this. And then there's those really cool shots of all the ships leaving. Only they don't really leave. They just kind of like dissolve and disappear. But it's really cool to kind of see them over all of these major, uh, you know, cities and, and uh, locations around the world just kind of disappearing in the thin air, however their means of travel was. Again, this is what I think is one of the best sci-fi films of the last decade or two, maybe the best sci-fi film. It stirs up a lot of emotions in me watching the movie, just knowing like you know what she went through what she is going to go through because the movie kind of ends as it begins with her realizing that you know this is what's going to happen but she makes that choice anyways there's the conversation with her daughter where you know the daughter says they're obviously split up at that point in time and the daughter asks you know like you and you and daddy split and he doesn't look at me the same way and why is that and she says it has nothing to do with you it has he wasn't ready to hear something that I I told him. And when she asked, what was it that you told him? She was like, well, it concerns, you know, a very rare disease. And it's basically like her daughter is going to get whatever this rare disease is. And Ian isn't happy about that because she knew that that was going to happen if, you know, they were to have a child. 
Louise says in her in her closing monologue that you know she accepts the journey, both the good and the bad, but she wants this in her life, you know this 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 love, however short lived it might be. I think she's probably twelve ish or so when the daughter dies. In the book, she's much older. She's about double that age. Okay. Uh, when she dies, but it's not. She's she dies like in the, like a rock climbing accident or something. She she doesn't have like a, a disease or a sickness. It's uh, implied that she kind of was doing some rock climbing and just fell. But at the end of the film, you know, as they're as they're getting ready to leave, there's. Uh, two lines that I think are just so fucking good that again, like really, like hit me. And it's when Renner, yeah, as they're waiting to leave, uh, and as they're waiting till we leave the site, you know, the aliens have already gone. Renner says, you know, hey, you know, I've been, I've been looking up the stars for as long as I can remember. And he says, but you want to know, like the most surprising thing to me, it wasn't meeting them. It was meeting you. And then, you know, they embrace and she says, I forgot how good it felt to be held by you. Even though it's happening for the first time in real life, but now that she has she's felt it the in vision the of sight, yeah, mm-hmm. she's felt it in the future. And it's then you see that, yeah, like Renner is the father of the child. And then there's the closing line I think the actual like closing line of the film is them, you know, together having a good time and he, you know, whispers to her like, Hey, do you want to make a baby? And she says, you know, absolutely. Which is the same way I should point out that the that the story ends mm-hmm. is with that line, you know, do you want to make a baby? And even though she knows what's going to happen eventually, she still chooses. That but I think I think it's it's just like such a for me, it's just like such a powerful ending, I, along with the fucking the music, the nature of daylight playing too. It, that really gets me emotional at the end. But I really do love those two lines where he says, "You know, it, it wasn't meeting them; it was meeting you." That like surprised me the most. And she says, "You know, if I forgot what it felt to be held by you, or how good it felt to be held by you." I also like when she um, Louise is kind of walking us through what's going on and what's going to inevitably happen with her daughter. But she's basically like, like I would pick this same, I would choose this path like over and over Mm -hmm. again, which is also the way that that's presented. It's very emotional, emotionally driven. Very good ending. Yeah. I agree. And the the movie bookends, like as it kind of began with her, you know, going through the, you know, her daughter's life and, and all that. And knowing that eventually she will get sick and, and pass away and it'll break her heart. And like the, her daughter's name is Hannah and that's a pallid, a palindrome, mm-hmm. which is really cool because, you know, it's spelt the same forwards and backwards, which ties into, you know, it's with time. I, when I watched this movie, I remember like texting you and being like, "Yo, like Arrival is so fucking good, dude. Check it out." But you had seen it like the opening, the weekend or something, so you had seen it. And you're like, "Oh yeah, dude, I watched it. It's so good." Yeah, I remember when we when we saw it. It was like a packed theater. Yeah, because I watched it like on a Monday when like out, when I got out of work, it was like starting like at one o'clock or something. I was wrapping up work for the day, so I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna sit in on Arrival." Streaming on Paramount, you can watch Arrival with Paramount Plus, and if you have a YouTube TV uh, subscription, you can watch it through there. Okay, yeah, well. it's, I mean, I own it, obviously, and I just watched it, and then I was going through some channels, I was like, oh, it's literally on going to be on Showtime, like, tomorrow or something. So, yeah, Paramount Plus. Um, okay, you ready to get into... Ready. Post? Uh, you said it opened on November 11, 2016. Shitty weekend. It was right after the 2016 election. I think a lot of us were feeling very defeated at that point in time. Uh, hopefully our uh, November show this year is going to be under much happier circumstances. But yeah, I remember <laughs> I kind of being like, 
very defeated after the uh, the 2016 election, just knowing that this was our future for four years. Thankfully, just the four. Hopefully not for another four. But uh, opens on November 11th. It, it, it premiered at like the Venice Film Festival in September. I told you it was at Fantastic Fest mm-hmm. uh, that September as well. Played at Telluride, Toronto International. So it had been seen by, by many people. And it's usually like when it... I think Venice and Toronto were kind of like the first indications of like what are going to be like the Oscar movies uh, coming down the pipe. Um, so it opens in third place, unfortunately, behind the second weekends of Doctor Strange and Trolls. But it still opens to like 24 million, which is a pretty solid opening for a pretty heady, you know, adult oriented sci fi film. Um, but I mean, it doubled. Uh, I read it doubled Paramount's uh, expectations for it. They were being very conservative. They were expecting about twelve to fifteen million on its opening weekend. It does, you know, o- almost double that on opening weekend. And then, as you say, like it goes, it goes on to to gross a uh, hundred million here and a hundred another hundred million or so overseas. But here's some reviews. I already read you time about it being an alien movie for people who don't like alien movies. Uh, The Telegraph says, An introspective, philosophical, and existentially inclined, yet it unfolds in an unwavering tenor of chest-tightening excitement. There is a mid-film revelation, less a sudden twist than sleek unwinding of everything you think you know. That is, you thought you were seeing flashbacks, you were actually seeing flash-forwards into the future. That feels like when it hits you, like your seat is tipping back. Uh, IGN gives it a score of 8.5 out of 10 and writes, Arrival is a language lesson masquerading as a blockbuster, though much more entertaining than it sounds. It's smart, sophisticated sci-fi that asks big questions and does a pretty good job of answering them. Uh, Unfortunately, our friend Roger Ebert was already passed on at this point in time, but his website, whoever was writing for the website, gives it three out of four stars, says it's a movie designed to simultaneously challenge viewers, move them, and get them talking. For the most part, it succeeds. I have a couple more good ones, and then a couple of shitty reviews, unfortunately. This one I forgot when I was doing my notes, so I had to write it down longhand today, and it was a long quote, so you can see my notes are all over the place. Uh, Guardian said that it amounts to something transcendent, something to reignite your excitement for cinema for life. And, I mean, I agree with that one wholeheartedly. There's some movies that, you know, are just movies to you, and then there's some movies that are, like, kind of transcend that, and, like, it's, like, what you would call cinema. Like, wow, like, this, this really blows me away. Um... So, Entertainment Weekly, which I was always a big reader of, uh, gives it an A-. minus. says, a large-scale movie star sci-fi filtered through the tricky, esoteric lens of art house cinema. And then here's a long quote coming. Bear with me, because it's all longhand and tiny writing. Arrival's endgame can seem obtuse, and its emotion submerged, suggesting a film as chilly as its palette of Pantone blues and grays. But it's all in service of building to its final revelation and also of conveying Louisa's enormous loss. She's her own kind of lonely astronaut, set adrift from everything that once defined her, parent, partner, teacher. With these creatures, at least she's needed. In fact, the fate of the world may rest on it. That's the movie's greatest faint, though. Ultimately, it's far less interested in galactic destiny than infinite uncharted landscape of the human heart. I thought that was a very good quote. That's why I copied that entire long quote down. You know, Amy Adams, she puts in an incredible performance. Her performance gets shouted out by a few uh, publications. Los Angeles Times writes that Arrival is really Amy Adams' film, a showcase for her ability to quietly and effectively meld intelligence, empathy, and reserve. And USA USA Today said Adams would be a definite contender for Best Actress come award season. She was spectacular in giving Louise the right emotional balance. Unfortunately, she did not get that nomination like she should have. And then here's some shitty reviews. 
Slate praises its cinematography and score, but criticized the dialogue as clunky and unfavorably compared it to Interstellar, which they also did not like. And Rex Reed in the New York Observer gave the film one out of four stars and called it Villeneuve's latest exercise in pretentious poopery and commented that the movie had a lack of action. I'm sorry that it wasn't fucking Independence Day, dude. Did he not like 2001? Because that has a serious lack of action throughout most of that movie. I think the taking a... Well, you you even went over it. That was all intentional, right? Like, he steered away from that style of... That It's not... Like, you can have a, a sci-fi movie that isn't about, like, aliens blowing shit up. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, again... If anything, this movie is kind of commenting on how we, and I want to say the world, are really, can be really fast to be like, oh, we're going to war. Yeah. You know, and kind of stopping that, that, uh, how do you say, instinct. Yeah. So it's yeah. cool. We need to communicate with them to figure out. Uh, you know what what goes on? Not fucking. Oh, they said weapon, so fucking let's get them first. Yeah. Which we we talked about the kangaroo story, but when when she tells that to Forrest Whitaker, you know he's kind of blown back. He's kind of taken aback by that and says, "Okay, like you know we'll do it your way." But as he walks out, he says, "Remember what happened to the Aborigines? Like a more advanced race nearly wiped them out." Kind of saying like, you know, we can try to communicate with these people, but. Or with these aliens, but... uh, We have no idea what they're capable of. They might just be here to destroy us. But you're right, like, it's... It's a very realistic approach to... Instead of just immediately going on the defense, saying... We're here, we want to understand why they are here. And we don't need to have, like, a show of force. We can just start opening a dialogue with them and seeing like, what are, what is your purpose? I watched it, you know, after work one day, really, really enjoyed it. And then a little bit later, uh, a couple of weeks later, like my dad was, or a couple of days later, excuse me, my dad was asking me about it. Cause he had like heard or he had like read the reviews, whatever he heard about it. And he was like, Oh yeah. Like that arrival movie sounds like really good. And I was like, yeah, I watched it. You know, after, when I got out of the work uh, the other day, it was, it was excellent. He was like, oh, I think I want to see it. So I took him to see it. Fucking loved it. Thought it was great. And then, like, really was kind of taken aback with that twist, too, where she's slowly seeing her future, so what you think are flashbacks are actually her getting glimpses of what's to come, actually. The future, yeah. Yeah. It's a cool realization. Yeah. Uh, Something that we didn't really talk about is um, Adams did a lot of research with linguistic professors so um she really met with uh uh this one woman by the name of jessica coon who was a linguistics expert that was consulted and she said the film gets well the, the film gets exactly right is both the interactive nature but also that you have you really have to start small when you're trying to communicate when you don't speak the same language as someone and you're trying to, to learn from each other and trying to learn, you know, each other's language. Ted Chang, who wrote the short story that this is based on, had this to say. I think it's the rarest of the rare that it's both a good movie and a good adaptation. And when you consider the track record of adaptations of written science fiction, that's almost literally a miracle. So it sounds like he was a big, big fan of, of what they did. I mean, they took his story. That was a short story, you're right. It's only about 50 pages. And uh, turned it into this this marvelous film. Um, okay, so we get to the Academy Awards. We always establish she famously gets snubbed. And I'll read you who else was in the, the running that year. But this is what it's awarded, or this is what it gets nominated for. Best Picture, Best Director, Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Cinematography, Best Production Design, Best Film Editing, Best Sound Mixing, and Best Sound Editing. And I think Sound Editing was... Unfortunately, the only award it actually takes takes. Uh, I mean, considered one of the biggest snubs is that Amy Adams was not 
uh, nominated. It's also the only Best Picture nominee that year to not have any acting awards. Yeah, why the fuck did they do that? I'll read you the list. There's a couple that probably don't belong on here. Um, she was given the Best Actress by the Natural National Board of Review. And then, as we established, also missing out on an award nomination was Johan Johansson's score because of that stupid rule with he used, you know, existing music. Mm-hmm. He didn't, he just used, like, it's kind of like you have an original score in your movie and uh, you have, like, a song playing over the end credits. No one is going to confuse that with an original score. Like, you can use existing music. I don't know why the rules are so fucking dumb. Uh, you want to get actress first? Yes. Okay. This is who else was nominated for, or who got the best actress nominations that year instead of Amy Adams. Emma Stone for La La Land. Uh, Isabel Hubert for Elle. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. It's a Paul Verhoeven movie. Uh, a little too rapey for my tastes. A lot of rape in that movie. Um, Ruth Nega in Loving. She's great in that movie. I wouldn't kick her out. Um, Natalie Portman and Jackie, who I think is also pretty good in that movie, because I like that movie a lot. And Meryl Streep and Florence Foster Jenkins. I'm sorry, Meryl. I love you. You got to get the boot. You are not. That was just like kind of a, it's Meryl Streep, so we're going to give her a nomination type of deal. Uh, who pair is good in L? That's just like, again... That movie is not for my tastes. Uh, Emma Stone is the one who wins the award in La La Land. Hey, we're talking about this movie for a reason. We're talking about Amy Adams for a reason. I definitely would have given Amy Adams the award over Emma Stone that year. Emma Stone, who's great in La La Land, I honestly think she was much better in Poor Things, which she just won for this last year. So that's who Adams uh, was would have been up against. I think Kinds of Kindness just hit Hulu. You should check it out. It's it's a weird movie, but I was like not bored through any of it. Like it was like pretty compelling, and each each of those stories is fucking wild, or like gets to a super wild point, and uh, they're almost like different genres too. Okay. I don't want to spoil anything, but if you watch it, you have to let me know what you think of like the second story. Okay. In that. Um, here's the best picture nominees that year. Moonlight, which is what the eventual winner is, even though they fucked up the, the thing and declared it La La Land, which probably would have made sense at the same time too. I'm glad Moonlight won because Moonlight is the better film saying that as someone who really does enjoy La La Land quite a lot, much to a lot of people's <laughs> confusion. Um, Arrival. Fences, which I think you and I have kind of been very meh on. Denzel is great in it, as is Viola Davis. I also think that first half is so fucking boring. Hacksaw Ridge, I'm not a huge fan of. I have my personal reasons on that one. Andrew Garfield is good, though. Hell or High Water, my second favorite movie of the year. Pretty fucking good, dude. That movie is good, a movie you and I have covered on this podcast, along with James, many years ago. Uh, Only assholes drink Dr. Pimp. <laughs> a very fucking good movie. Uh, my second favorite movie of the year. Much like... 2015 was Ex Machina, and then like Sicario was a very close runner-up. To that, uh, Arrival is my favorite, and Hell or High Water is a very close runner-up to that. Um, Hidden Figures, La La Land, Lion, which I've never seen Lion. You ever seen Lion? Mm-mm. With Dev Patel? No. Maybe I should watch that movie. I remember someone telling me it was good, but I just never saw it. And then uh, Manchester by the Sea, which is... I like Manchester by the Sea. It's good, but it is not a happy movie. Oh, no. It's very harrowing. <laughs> um, has some fantastic performances in it. Again, we're talking about this movie for a reason. You know it's my favorite movie of 2016. Along with Moonlight, Hell or High Water, La La Land, all those movies I loved. 
Strong year. That's that's a pretty strong year. I don't like them switching to the, you know, we'll do like more than five. Sometimes I think kind of dilutes the the impact of it. As someone who famously has said multiple times, I don't really care for the Academy Award stuff. But there's a couple they can probably ditch. Moonlight was the best picture winner. Moonlight is fantastic. I kind of like if Beale Street could talk a little bit better, though. <laughs> Which is famously, like, looked over that, that year, the, the following two years later. Which is funny because Moonlight was the best picture winner and it was La La Land was the one that everyone thought was kind of like the, the money favorite mm-hmm. to win and kind of does win for those 60 seconds or whatever until they realize they fucked up. Which I feel bad for the Moonlight team and for Barry Jenkins on that because it was kind of like they had they could have had like that big moment and instead it kind of got taken away from them. But um, both of those guys come out with movie, uh, two movies The they each come out with a movie two years later that I think is better. I think if Beale Street could talk is better than Moonlight and is completely ignored and I think that First Man is a masterpiece and I would rank it above La La Land as far as I'm concerned. Another one completely ignored. I'm just wondering if they thought, well, you know, those guys were in the mix with their movies a couple years ago, and we're just not going to pay attention this time. But again, as much as I love Moonlight and La La Land, I really like If Beale Street Could Talk and A First Man better. Uh, Who are your director nominees? Damien Chazelle, who wins for La La Land. Villeneuve, Mel Gibson. Uh, Kenneth Logarin for uh, Manchester by the Sea, which I wouldn't have said was like a great directed movie. That's a much better written and acted movie. And then Barry Jenkins for for Moonlight. I was just trying to look at like what were the other big awards that it was nominated for. The the only other one uh, was cinematography. La La Land is the one that that wins. But uh, the guy that wins for that movie also shot American Hustle, also shot Joy, First Man, um, and someone's favorite movie of last year, Saltburn. <laughs> um, the guy that was actually nominated for Lion, Greg Frazier, has been a uh, Villeneuve's cinematographer on both of the Dune films. Okay. So, uh, um, that's his thing. He also shot Zero Zero Dark Thirty and Rogue One and The Batman. And then uh, the guy that shot Moonlight has also done If Beale Street Could Talk. He's doing Mufasa, which is Jenkins' new movie, which I saw that trailer when I saw Alien, maybe. And I was like, why? Why do this movie? Very random. (laughs) And then uh, Rodrigo Prieto who was nominated for Silence, which I've told you before. I know you've seen it, but any other people who are listening who haven't, because it was kind of like a blink and you'll miss it movie, Scorsese's movie for Silence, very good. Andrew Garfield is very good in that movie. I'm surprised that that movie just got completely overlooked. Um, But Rodrigo Prieto also shot 8 Mile, 25th Hour, Brokeback Mountain, Wolf of Wall Street, Irishman, Killers of Flower Moon. He's been like Scorsese's guy ever since uh, um, at least The Wolf of Wall Street. Again, that was my favorite movie of 2016. One of the best sci-fi movies. 2016 had like a strong, was a fairly strong year. As you said, you know what else was out in 2016? The Witch. Oh, wow. Yeah. Green Room, which you just mentioned. Midnight Special, which I've I've recommended a couple of shows ago, because you know that I really, really love that movie. Um, Loving, good movie. Uh, speaking of the Midnight Special and Loving, um, both Jeff Nichols movies in the same year. The last two that he made before Bike Riders. Uh, the Nice Guys, a movie that you and I really fucking love that you've covered on this podcast before twice covered it twice twice 
Do it like a third time. <laughs> Silence. Edge of 17. The Accountant. Good movie. Don't Breathe. Good movie. Up until like maybe the last act. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit. That, that's, a- that's a pretty solid year. Like 2016 was kind of a shit year. Like in general. But like as films go. It's pretty good. 10 Cloverfield Lane, which I, I mentioned at Dude. the top of the show. Whoa. <laughs> Kubo and, two, and the Two Strings, a movie which I really love, uh, was the only Leica movie I've ever seen. Someone who was just trying to get me to watch Coraline a couple days ago because she was saying it was her favorite movie. Also, Coraline's 15 years old already. I That's know. insane. Did you go watch the re-release? No. Okay. My yeah. friend that I work with, she went to see the re-release and uh, she was like, yeah, that's like my favorite movie. I can't believe you've never seen it. I was like, mm. it's a good movie. I, I will watch it eventually. Don't get me wrong. But those, those movies were all out in 2016. So kind of a shitty year, but in film, not so much as shitty year. Some heavy, heavy hitters. Man. That's a good movie. I mean, you know, I forget what my my top five or ten were, but obviously like Moonlight, Hell or High Water, Arrival, La La Land, The Nice Guys. I don't think I had seen Green Room at the time because I borrowed that off of you a couple years after that. Yeah, it kind of fell through the cracks for you. Yeah. But, I mean, a lot of those movies were on my favorite movies of the year list. I didn't see Silence when it came out because, like I said, it was came and went. I didn't see that until a couple years after. But good, good year. We are going to leave the sci-fi behind. We are going to do a Western next month. One of my favorite Westerns from a director that we've talked about before a few years back. Uh, love this movie. Another iconic score. Some pretty iconic uh, performances in it, in my opinion. Uh, it's a John Wayne movie, and it's called The Searchers. I am kidding. We would never cover a fucking John Wayne movie. At least with me. Uh, But a a good Western that is up there with one of the best ever made from a guy that we've talked about before. I can't wait to talk this one. I listen to the soundtrack a lot too. And uh, yeah. What else? What else is there to tease? How else can I tease that? Unless you have a thought. Very iconic. The opening sequence of this movie kicks so much ass and nothing really happens. (laughs) But it's so awesome. Uh, Stay tuned. We're going to be starting our spooky. Starting your spooky season. I can't wait. We have a good Halloween movie, you and I, though. Yes. One of the iconic horror films. Actually, yeah. Yes. Can't wait to talk. I can't wait to talk about it either, and I have a good title for it. Hell yeah. If you're stumbling upon this podcast, we go by Drop the Mic. We're available on a plethora of platforms, including Spotify, um, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, um, Amazon Podcasts, you name it. If it plays a podcast, we're most likely on there, so search us up. And um, give us a follow, subscribe, a like, um, a little five-star rating or review. It all helps us uh, stay relevant in those engines. So, yeah, check us out if you uh, if you don't know what we do. Um, check out this movie if you haven't seen it. Arrival. Yes. Arrival. Check it out. Find it. Should be on Paramount+. Plus. Um, yeah, and I guess, uh, with that being said, thank you, Chris, for your time. This was a great show as usual. Thank you. I hope it was a very good show. I hope I didn't get, uh, too lost or rambly at any point in time. I hope my stomach growling on mic for the first hour or so <laughs> does not distract your listeners. Yeah. Another summer sci-fi. It's our third annual. In the books. I, we have some solid sci-fi picks for next year that hopefully will be finalized by the, uh, by the end of the year. Yep. Very exciting stuff. But uh, yeah, thanks for this tonight, man. It was great. Thank you. Thank you for always coming and for always letting me come on and, and uh, talk film with you. Anytime. 
It's always a pleasure. Uh, everybody out there, if you're listening to this, go support Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Give it a chance. And if it's still playing, maybe it's not because it was a smaller movie, check out Strange Darling, a movie that you and I really loved. Yes, 100% support Strange Darling because it deserves all of the press, all of the best uh, positive reviews in the world. Definitely going to be talking about that later on. I think we will. I think on that note, uh, we'll get out of here, man. All right. This is um, Wesley and Chris signing off, saying good fight. And good night. I would never forget what you said. What is it? You told me my wife's dying words. Found the source of the phone call. It's in the clean room. I'm waiting for instructions. What are you doing? Changing someone's mind. Can you buy me 20 seconds? No, trust me. Buy me 20 seconds. You trust me. Okay. You trust me. Jim, Jim. Hi. Dr. Banks? Drop the phone now or we shoot. Jim, Jim. Drop it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Jim, Jim. Drop it. You are committing an act of treason. Drop it! It's done. I'm done.